Good evening, everyone. My name is Angela Mills, and I work for the Town of Amherst. This meeting is being recorded on the Town of Amherst Zoom account. It will be uploaded to Amherst Media, and Amherst Media is on this call, and I believe they are live streaming it. Um, the Town of Amherst uh, is hosting some meetings via Zoom due to the suspension of some of the open meeting laws by our wonderful governor <laughs> as a result of um, former COVID restrictions. At this time, I want to remind everyone that if you're in the attendee room when it comes to public comment, we ask that you please raise your hand. Because it's Zoom webinar, you will be promoted or your raise hand will be in the order in which you raise your hand. So if you're the first person to raise your hand, you'll be at the top of the list and then it will progress as people raise hands. If you're calling into this meeting, you will have to press star nine to raise your hand. And then the same thing, you'll fall in line with the others who have raised their hands. And at this time, I'd like to recognize the chair of the school committee, Sarah Marshall, and I will make um, Naibi your co-host, Sarah. I hope you have a Thank great you. meeting. Thank you so much, Angela. Yes, yeah, seeing the presence of a quorum, I'm calling this meeting of the Amherst School Committee to order at 6.34 p.m. on October 15th, 2024. We are meeting remotely uh, at the last minute because of uh, the heat is out in the high school and it's just uncomfortably cold, cold. And we're sorry that that happened. Of course, it's unpleasant for everyone working in the school and an inconvenience to, to members of the public perhaps. So please bear with us. We're trying to, we'll be doing the best we can to um, get all the public comment heard and, and hope people are finding their way to this meeting. So um, because we are meeting remotely, I need to take attendance uh, I, by roll call and everyone, committee members need to answer so that I know we can hear you and you can hear us. So I'm Sarah Marshall, I'm here. Irv Rhodes. I'm here. Jennifer Shaw. Here. Bridget Hines. Here. Deb Leonard. Here. Are you are you able to turn your camera on? Or are you not at this time? No. Sounded like not at this time. Okay. Not at this time, no. All right. Thank you. We're also having a hard time hearing you, so maybe you can be closer to your microphone. Yep. All right. The first order of business is public comment. If there's anyone in the attendees who would like to make a public comment, please use the raised hand function to indicate that. And I will ask you to unmute. So the raised hand should, little icon should be at the bottom of your screen. And Point I will, of order. Who was that? Deb. Deb, yes? Did you post a sign on the high school um, door? I did ask Nivey. Yes, okay. thank you so much, Naimi, yes. Thank you. All right, I don't see anyone uh, with the raised hand in the audience. Oh, whoop, two. So first I will ask Roger. Sarah, can you clarify that there's three minutes for public comment? Yes, yeah, okay. I do that when they, when they come in. So Roger, please unmute yourself, state your full name and uh, where you live, please. And then you have up to three minutes for a comment. My name is Roger Wallace. I <clears throat> live at, in Amherst on Gent Street. Uh, I have a comment that is actually going to be slightly out of place, but I thought it was the time for, <clears throat> excuse me, public comment. So I'm going to make it. Uh, we as educators know that we are often the answer to our children's educational needs. We are also aware at the same time, and I, I think for all of us, we cannot be all things to all people. The students at 80 Acres, for which you will hear about later, are getting a look at our world and the environment in which they live and inhabit in a slightly different way. 80 Acres stands for things that are important. The Roger Lawrence Wallace Excellence in Teaching Award is focused on issues of social justice and community building within the elementary school community at Wildwood, Fort River, Crocker Farms, Pelham. 
80 acres and the foundation is firmly predicated on those same concepts that we find in, the, in Rajwal EIT and our central part of the award. I love public schools. 38 years in Amherst, one year in Worcester would, would certainly be evidence of that. But at the same time, I embrace the idea that an alternative place to educate our young students is extremely important. I have attended several events at the school and they truly embrace the notion of community in a social justice environment. And so as you listen to Adrian, who is my daughter, I don't even hesitate to say that, I hope you keep those ideas in mind. Thank you very much for hearing me out. Thank you very much. Next is Reed P. Please unmute yourself and then state your, your full name and where you live, and then you have three minutes. Sure. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Go ahead, please. Yep. My name is uh, Reed Parsons. I live in Amherst. Um, and I'm here to share my thoughts um, and views as a parent of an 80 acres climate justice co-op school kindergartner. And I also have two older kids in the ARP schools. Um, the Climate Justice Cooperative Homeschool is really a special place and it plays a special role in our community and the lives of the young people who enroll there. Uh, it deserves the opportunity to serve more families and be recognized as a licensed private school, in my opinion. Uh, from a parent's perspective, I appreciate the school's uh, small class sizes, currently less than six kids in a class, which ensures students get ample attention and guidance from the full-time teachers who work there. Students engage in hands-on, often outdoor activities, collaborate with one another in projects that span and bring together art, science, math, language arts, history, and music. For example, my kindergartner is currently working on creating their own superhero, complete with a written description of superpowers, costume decal, and even a theme song. This project is just one example of the interdisciplinary self-empowering projects students undertake. In the process of working on these projects, my child is growing lasting relationships with teachers and friends in a learning environment that is dedicated to supporting their whole selves. I also happen to be an earth science educator in higher education, and I value the school's focus on human interaction and connection with the earth while providing an understanding of environmental justice and its connection to racial justice. The kids are learning about where food comes from, how it is grown, they get an opportunity to grow some themselves. The connection between food and culture, they're learning about indigenous practices. All these things help them become good environmental stewards. We as a society need to come to terms with the fact that those who will be most hard hit by climate change, both domestically and abroad, are BIPOC communities. So we must address the environmental crisis and social inequity as connected issues. The 80 Acres Climate Justice Co-op School does this by empowering kids to be the compassionate change makers needed to bring a brighter future. Finally, as a member of the community concerned with the well-being of our neighbors, a category that I'm sure many folks here would count themselves among, I implore you to consider who benefits from the services 80 Acres offer, offers. This school is a safe place for kids and families of all backgrounds, but specifically provides a safety net for BIPOC families who may have dealt with bias, either implicit or explicit, in their kids' schools. These loving parents deserve to have a choice of where to send their kids, uh, just as white families do. Excuse me, please finish up. It's been three minutes. Okay. Uh, so I that really concludes my remarks. Okay. So thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Um, and please, Roger and Reed, uh, lower your hand, um, or, or I may think you want to speak again, which would be irregular. Next is John. Um, please unmute yourself and then enter and give us your full name, where you live, and you have three minutes. Okay. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Go ahead. Okay. Great. Uh, my name is John Bilderbeck. I live in Amherst. I'm actually driving home from the high school, having attempted to attend in person. Um, 
My comment is really uh, in advance of some of the written comments that were submitted for today's meeting, uh, particularly um, as a parent of two children at Fort River Elementary. I'm writing with my preemptive support of Caminantes um, for any number of reasons. Um, there are some concerns among the parent community um, about whether the um, school committee and the new superintendent are as supportive about Caminantes as we the parents would like to see. And I just want to use my time public comment to say that Caminantes was the reason why we chose to purchase a house in Amherst and live here with our two children. I have a bicultural family, and I want my children to be able to speak with my grandmother, my uncle, cousins in a different country. We value bicultural education. We value bilingual education. And um, I want to go on record that many, many parents feel like Caminantes is a real asset to the community. I am not certain um, any of the uh, plans or discussions that have or have not taken place about Caminantes, but the point is that there is uncertainty being felt among the parents, and we really would like the school board and the superintendent to um, uh, come out and be transparent about their intentions and support for the program. Thank you. Thank you. All right, that ends public comment. So the next item on the agenda is the chair's update, which I posted on board docs to um, two quick items. Uh, and no one, it, it is still the case that no one has volunteered to go to the MASC conference. So I'm, I just assume we are passing on that this year. But I did want to um, bring to the fore two items that are really for agenda planning, but I need to know tonight. So I didn't want to wait till the end and we might run out of time. Um, these two items, I don't want to get into the, the content of what they're about because they're not noticed as being issues we're going to deliberate on. I simply want to know. Um, whether the committee is interested in being involved. The first has to do with this um, report on the state of the schools that the chair has to make to the town of Amherst in December. I asked Jennifer about this a few weeks ago. She has no recollection of past chairs ever involving the school committee. <laughs> so, so, so that's fine. I'm happy to do it all myself. Um, but I want to give the school committee members here the opportunity to say, no, we, we want to see it and approve it ahead of time, um, which, which would be fine, except still a little tricky because we only have one more regular meeting before it is due. All right, so I think I'm going to, I, I will say that unless I hear substantial protest, I will do this myself the, the whole committee will, of course, see it <laughs> and get it. And I would welcome your ideas for what ought to be included for highlights of the past year for the elementary schools. I posted examples of past reports. So does anyone want to do, want the committee to be more directly involved? This is the time to raise your hand. And Reed, can you put your hand down, please? Public comment is over. I'm sorry to interrupt. I just realized that there are people that are trying to access the public comments um, and we're not able to do so. Um, I think they're having some technical difficulties or they're in an audience room or something like that. Is there a possibility we can have that looked into? Well, I see many people. Thank you for um, for raising that. And I will just say there are many people present as attendees. Uh, I think many have come in in the last few minutes, perhaps. And I considered that this might happen. People might go over to the high school and then only find out that the meetings um, then moved online. So I. 
I will have another few minutes for public comment later in the meeting, all right? Okay, thank you. Thank you for bringing that up. So anyone who wishes to make comment, public comment, just hold tight and we'll, we'll come back to that. So I don't see any committee members with raised hands wanting to intervene. I'm not taking any public comment at this time. Um, all right, so that's what I'll do. Moving on, the second item I need to know whether to put on next month's agenda is whether this committee wishes as a body to submit a comment to DESE regarding uh, the Pioneer Valley Chinese Immersion Charter Schools request to expand enrollment by 100 seats. We could do something collectively. We could submit comments as individuals. If we want to do it collectively, that again has to be on the um, agenda for next next month. Bridget, Sarah, you're muted. Um, oh, yep. I think I'm there now. Mm -hmm. Yes, I would. I would like to be part of um, putting together something, or that we do as a committee, to um, to speak to the the type of. Um, situations and equities that are, arise as the school expands over there. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Any other committee members? I, I asked for a volunteer. Is there, are other committee members um, agreeable to, uh, let's say if Bridget and I draft something and bring it to the November meeting? Feel free. Jennifer's nodding. Irv, is that I'm fine. You're fine. Uh, Deb, do you yep. have an opinion? Yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much, Bridget. I will be in touch tomorrow about, <laughs> about how to, yeah, how to proceed with that. All right. Um, I didn't receive any school committee announcements, but it's not too late. Do any members have announcements? No. Okay. Then... So Sarah, did we report out? Sorry, I can't raise my hand right now. Did oh. we report out on the um, elementary school building um, final bid situation? I think it was preliminary last time. Um, it was in. Well, I haven't heard any more than was in a press release from the town and that uh, Superintendent uh, Herman, I think, also issued a. a okay. So if there's something more that you know that we don't. <laughs> That's, I just didn't remember the timing of that announcement with respect yeah. to. Yeah, September seems like an awfully long time ago. Yeah. Okay, All right. Um, so, I'll, so we'll have the superintendent's update and then we'll approve the minutes and then we'll open for public comment again. All right. And then we'll get into our new business. So Dr. Z, do you- uh, not, Mm -hmm. I asked for, um, okay, I just wanted to make sure I could share my screen. Give me one second. Let me bring it up. Can everyone see? Yes. Okay. Can you see the presentation? Yes. Okay, because I think I'm going to address some of the emails that I saw around public comment and some things today, especially when it comes to the programming. Um, I mean, let me start off by saying, I think that at every point of my leadership, I've been very clear on the fact that I am a transparent person, I am a honest person, and I am a person that leads with integrity and with accountability, respect. And so... Um, We'll start off with our ARPS priorities. As always, our three priorities, student safety and well-being, healing and stabilization of the district or districts. And I want to say that one of the things that I'm working on with our office, our communication office, and we're going to get that out, is an infographic, um, not just for this committee, but for the, all the communities that I serve. I think that one of the things that I've realized is that an... Um, it's going to come out in my entry findings, is that individuals forget that I am one superintendent, but I serve three separate districts. And so at any point and any given time, 
when I'm speaking, I need to be very clear on what district that I'm speaking on. And even though individuals like the media may present me as the Amher superintendent at that time, the content may be geared towards Pelham or the content may be geared towards the region. And even more so, this whole um, committee body serves on the regional um, committee. So, you know, we really need, I need the community and I need individuals to be mindful of the fact that when I speak um, or when things are presented, what lens I speak from. And I'm going to start presenting that so everyone is clear. And of course, data, data and accountability for equity. And I need to be very, um, as a superintendent, I have to have, I'm going to call it an umbrella view. And I have to look at what's best for all children. Um, and equity is not equality. And so when we look at what's happening in the districts and when, we're, and when we look at what the data states, um, or if there is even data, then we need to delve deep, deeper into that, into how does it work so that every, so that we're creating a system or systems that meet the needs of not just the few, but also the many. So our agenda today, I'm gonna to go into our Cracker Farm recognition. I'm gonna talk a little bit about CPAC um, and how they were recognized as well as I'm gonna hit on some points with the Caminantis program, because I think that individuals are quoting from one lens and not from the full lens. And so I wanna make sure that what is presented, it's stated clearly. Um, and I think that interpretation of what individuals want to hear directly or want me to say is not what I'm going to say. I'm gonna say what the facts are in front of me and what I'm faced with. And so um, I'm hoping that we could have deeper discussions moving forward around what it looks like and what my approach is. Um, and then there was a request, um, Chair, um, Sarah, you asked about our school choice numbers. And so I wanted to present that as well. I am still working on the class ratios. I have that for you. Um, but I think that I need to kind of break that down and kind of put that in its own update to walk through the committee and the class, um, the student class sizes that was requested. So first of all, Cracker Farm was rec rec uh, recognized as a DESE 2024 School of, of Recognition. Um, that was really great. These schools are selected through the state's district and school accountability system, which evaluates school based um, on various criteria, overall achievement and growth. Um, this means that we were exceeding standards and reflects the hard work of our dedicated staff, student and families of Cracker Farm. This is really great great um, and critical for us to say that there's designation as a school of recognition by DESE is a testament to our great work um, and the achievement highlights the commitment. And so I'm truly, truly honored um, to say thank you for the great work to Derek, um, to Alicia, to all of the strong individuals that work at Crocker Farm, the, the teachers, para-educators, even our cafeteria staff serves as educators, our custodians. So the Crocker Farm family, where Crocker Farm, they care. Um, it's really, really a big deal. And so congratulations to them. Um, I want to talk in my update about our CPAC. Our CPAC was recognized. Um, and I received an email from one of our CPAC parents in terms of the great work that's happening in terms of Disability Awareness Month. And so they have been highlighted. I think this is the Amherst Current. And one of the key things is if you drive in front of our school and I wanted to show this picture, there are these wonderful signs that talk about inclusivity, neurodiversity, um, that CPAC has, has kind of flood and I'm gonna say subliminal messages as you drive over in front of our schools. Um, and so thank you to CPAC and just creating that level of awareness and inclusion and true um, moving forward. They are working um, and we are working together. They're working on a list of indicators around neurodiversity and priorities that we should take into consideration as a district when we're um, rolling out new initiatives, as well as when we are looking at trainings, what are some key indicators that should be included? And this is one of the ways that we are definitely working with our advisory councils to kind of build that level of collaboration and communication for all of our students. And um, I wanted to stop and talk about 
this because it seems like um, every time I address it, because, and I'm going to be very frank, because I'm not, I don't know if I'm saying things in a way that everyone receives it well, um, but I am coming in new and I need to take the opportunity to see what all programs are. And there was an email that was sent comparing Caminantes to the ILC program. And I felt, um, they, you know, there are things that individuals are not looking at um, and they can't compare one to the other. And so I wanted to take some time and kind of go into, you know, not just what we've seen, but what we're delving into and what are some key considerations for the future of the program. Um, one of the key things that we need to look at is to, in terms of federal regulations and Title III talks about, um, it doesn't talk specifically about bilingual education, it talks about our English learners. And the fact that we are under IDEA have a federal mandate for our ILC program. But when we start to talk about ILC and comparing it to Caminantes, it's two different ball games and leagues. Um, and so I know everyone is talking about IL, you know, but the one thing I would like to say is that our in our ILC program runs on the same pro schedule as Wildwood. And so when we talk about the pros and cons of Caminantes. There are a lot of pros. Um, let's talk about language development. We heard the parent during public comment talk about the fact that they want the students, they want their child to be able to speak to their family members in another language. So it's fostering fluency both in English and Spanish and enhances students' cognitive abilities to lead to problem solving and just that dual bilingualism. It's a big resource. So that language development. Um, a sense of cultural competency in ingratiating both language and cultures um, and creating that global citizenship. And I see that where our students who are primarily English speakers are in the classroom with individuals who are primarily um, Spanish speakers. And so that goes to inclusive environment for our English learners. Our students who are, are would have been Otherwise, tasks as an English learner is now engaged in the content um, with students who I would say are primarily in English speakers. And so it creates that true immersion of the English language, true immersion in the Spanish language. And you can see that there's opportunity for academic growth. Um, research has shown that dual language programs often outperform once it's implemented correctly, once there's strong instruction in both languages, once there is that level of commitment in terms of what the full programming and structure is supposed to be, teachers are well-trained, there is high opportunities for academic growth. And parental engagement, the Caminantes program has strong parental engagements because parents know what they want for their students, um, for their children, and they've outlined their needs. Um, some of the cons that we've seen so far is scheduling. And I think when I say that the Caminantes, and I don't have it here as a visual, but I will um, share it. When I say that the Caminantes program causes a scheduling conflict, it's, it runs its own schedule within Fort River. So right now what Fort River is, it's a building. And the building runs two separate schools. Caminantes has one schedule that runs, and then there is the other schedule that runs. And that's why I want to skip down to this actually causes a level of segregation of the school community, where you have individuals who are calling students monolinguals. I mean, that's a term, but then you have Caminantes explorers. And so you create not a unified school, you then have created an environment where the entire school community is segregated. You're either in the Caminantes program or you are in the Explorers program. You're, you're, you have where you, you have individuals being referring to children as this is a monolingual child. Like you start to put labels. And I sit back and I cringe at times because I think about what Amherst truly says it stands for in terms of inclusion, equity, and those different levels and how we have to start to build in and make sure that we're identifying that. And so it, it's a research base as we start to look at it, how are we now going to address the fact that Caminantes has kind of created a separate group of students based on their language proficiency 
um, leading to less interactions between English dominant and Spanish dominant students and segre literally segregating the school community. Um, one of the things that's an issue is our staff turnover. Our bilingual program reply, rely on specialized teachers. And even this year, right before, up until the school year started, we were still looking for certain grade levels teachers because we had a high turnover in our Caminantes program. And then there's gaps in our evaluation and monitoring. Um, so we need to have ongoing assessments. We need to have a deeper dive into the data to see academically how are our students who are in this program performing in comparison to their peers? There's been a lot of conversation around that data, but when I've asked, and now I'm delving into it, and we can talk some more um, after the MCAS presentation, but we're gonna circle back as a district team and look and see how are we evaluating? What does that data say? How are they performing in comparison to their peers? And how do we ad adequately monitor the program? So everyone seems to be concerned about what we're, what the future is. Um, one is program sustainability. We need to evaluate whether we have the adequate staffing, the budgetary resources or resources and supports to maintain the program over time. And how do we recruit and keep and attain staff members um, to make sure that we have the adequately trained bilingual educators that can impact the long term of the program and its viability. Um, we have to think about how are we adjusting to create an inclusive school culture where I can stand up and talk to parents and they not refer to children as monolinguals, or you know you don't have a school where we're talking about two completely separate schedules being run in the same school building. I also need to think about the fact that in two years the two schools are merging, how does that work together when we've adequately built a building that cannot sustain um, students from K through sixth grade? It only sustains K through fifth grade. Is Dr. Herman's video frozen for others? Yes. Okay. Definitely frozen. All right. Naibi, I don't know if you are near Dr. Herman. Yes, Naibi's working um, with Dr. Herman now to make sure she gets back up. Thank you. You're welcome. That was Tanya? Yeah. All right. Yes, I'll hang on. I assume Dr. Z's left and is going to rejoin. Sorry, we had our internet uh, signaled out, so we had to start back over. Oh my goodness. We're all in the office. Uh, she's coming back on in a second. Can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> awesome. I don't know where I froze. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's see. I wonder if somebody else, I wonder if I could share this screen and then you don't have to depend on your internet to do that. Um, you were talking about the, what you, I think what you need to work at. Yes, that's, thank you. Okay. You All right, I'm that. gonna go through it quickly. Yeah. Um, the things that we're considering um, so again, impact on school community. How do we create an inclusive culture where students do not feel like they're segregated um, based on language proficiency, uh, where we are creating an environment where all students feel like they are one and Fort River, instead of dividing the community, it is one whole community together. Um, we need to consider what are the academic outcomes and clearly show 
that there are academic growths. So we need to balance bilingual instruction with the core academic goals and ensure that students are adequately receiving the instruction that they need to be proficient and to meet, meet grade level proficiency, as well as showing, you know, just the successes of the program overall. Um, and make sure that we address our logistical challenges, again, that address, that, in, that consider our program sustainability, um, which is logistically the scheduling. And we've been, I've been researching and reading around the successes of bilingual programs, and they show that a well-implemented bilingual program can lead to academic success for both English learners and native English speakers. However, what happens is in the long term and over time, pro, there, there are often the challenges and, and situations start to, such as staffing, segregation, um, and academic rigor, start to impact the successes of these programs. And so there are strategies that various school districts have done. One is reviewing and ensuring that teachers are not only bilingual, but are trained in effective instructional strategies so that they can often run the class in both languages. Um, that is one consideration that I don't think we often have. Um, making sure that we create the opportunity for a full inclusive school culture. Um, there are school districts that have done implemented this and have made sure that they are they have found ways to curve the height of segregation, to curve what is happening within the the environment, so that it it presents as one school culture and all children belong there. I think the labels and titles have have created that, and we need to be very mindful of that as we engage with children and other speakers. Um, and then just making sure we have a balanced curriculum and long-term commitment to the overarching program needs to be one that is sustainable with the adequate resources and budgetary needs, as well as the um, continued family engagement that comes around the entire program and the possible restructuring of the program. Mm -hmm. So that's that, and I'm hoping school choice. Um, this year we had in Amherst, um, from K to six, we had about, I'm gonna say 58 available slots, um, of which 31 were accepted. And so um I will get that. I'm gonna, I'm working, I'm waiting on it by school. I'm gonna get it by school so that you can see how many slots slots were by school and where they were accepted to. So this is just the overarching number. I will get the committee that further detail. Um, to share um, in terms of school choice. And then I want to say thank you as always. Um, we have our feedback survey. This survey is up for about two more weeks um, to help with the entry into the program and just making sure that we are um, collecting where we would like to see the programs going. So I will stop sharing and see if we are open for any questions on the committee. Yes, questions for the superintendent, Jennifer. Hi, thanks, Dr. Z, for that update. Um, so, just regarding Tommy Nantes, I mean, I, I wanted, I just want to say, I am, I am firmly in support of continuing Tommy Nantes for the long term. I think it's a wonderful program and adds so much to our community, our school community. Um, I think that the, you know, we've heard, we've heard from, well, <laughs> uh, Sarah, you haven't shared the written public comment that we received, but hopefully, you will do that later in the meeting. I've read the written public comment, and we also had one. Um, public comment from we don't do that anymore <laughs> we don't oh, right. I forgot about that okay sorry so anyway it's on board docs there's written public comment about commonantes and i guess i want to say like the written public comment is very passionate from from parents who um whose children are in that program and i guess i, I want to say like people fear losing what's important to them so i think the fact that this program is so important to so many parents is why we're hearing from from parents. So the, the and and you know it, it they they may be misinterpreting the things that they've heard, but in a way that shows us that coming out is really important to them. So um, if 
if and if if problematic things have been revealed regarding Caminantes and the the the, the feeling mm -hmm. of segregation in the school and the uh, the feeling of being separated from the non Caminantes students, then those are things that we need to address and deal with in a way that supports the Caminantes program and the rest of the school community. So. Does Caminantes have to be on a different schedule? I don't quite understand. There's no bells ringing, right, in the elementary at, at Fort River. So I'm not, I don't quite understand what, what the difference of schedule is, but does it need to be on a different schedule? Can there be more integration with the rest of the school? Can we do things to, uh, to make sure that it does feel like one school and that there's more interaction between Caminantes and Explorers and so that it doesn't feel so separated? So I just, I wanna voice my support for continuing and committing to Caminantes long-term, whatever that looks like, in a way that serves the whole school community. I think that what, what was happening, Jennifer, is that because I'm not saying it in the way that, and, and again, I'm, I, I'm gonna be very clear. The comments that I read and I received are because of things that I said in response to what I was asked. And I'm not going to change how I said what I said. What I am going to say is, is that how it is run is an issue for how the building is able to be structured. It is an issue for the for the program that's there. It is. It's not like it's not going to go away with the problem and things, but there are pros to it. And I think that's the part that because I'm not talking solely about the pros, and that's why I said, here are the pros, here are the cons, here are our key con considerations and things that we have to hash into, but it cannot continue to run the way it is run. It can't and 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 it is just not realistic to to what's happening. And so I, for me, it's, I'm new, I'm coming in and the same questions you're asking, I am trying to delve into, I am trying to see, I'm trying to tear, to, to, to tear it apart and say, okay, what are we missing? Why is it this way? Because it, it just can't be that it can't, it can't be that difficult that we're not delving into it. And the one thing that I, that I, that I feel is that because it's not again saying, Hey, I have never said it's a horrible program. I've never said it's one that that we don't support. I'm I've consistently said what is best for children, I will stand behind of. But it has to be implemented in a way where we know how it's going to be sustained. We understand the problems that we're facing. I mean, if we don't have staff, then how who's going to teach the program if they're not trained to do that? And if there's instructional supports that need to be put into place and we don't have the funding or we don't have it there, like honestly and truly, we have to be, and I am not going to sit here and be and give the nice answer, which is to say, this is a great program, let's continue it next year, knowing good and well that there are things that need to be addressed, especially in the school community front, where we're talking about, we're literally talking about one building, but we're talking about how does one community in a building deal with the next? And I thought we came past that years ago. So I'm trying to figure out how do we like create a unified front where everyone feels like they belong in, in the same school. There are Fort River students. And then when we look at the students who attend, a lot of the students actually c come from Cracker Farm, Wildwood, like they actually belong and they come into Fort River, sorry, um, my sinuses have been on, on on edge the past couple of weeks and the cold isn't helping, so give me a minute. But um, they, they come into Fort River and they're in Fort River. But I'm saying for me, even the morning when I had sit and sip, it had a whole host of parents around me. And I said, how many of you are non coming on to parents? And I think one person was there. And so for me, like even to that, how do we engage everyone so that everyone feels like it's one unified front, it's one unified community and and it can be done. But I feel like the, the conversation is she's not saying this that we want to hear. And so that is the upset. She is telling us all of the things she's looking at and she's finding. Yes, because at the end of the day, I'm looking at Fort River as a whole that is housing two complete and and. I walked into it. There's an explorers program and there's a Caminantes program. Think about how we refer to the children and what's happening in the building. It's like two separate things happening in one in one building. And that's the reality. That's the truth. The truth is that Fort River might be a school, but the way how it's consistently presented to me, to anyone else that walks in, it's like, hey, this is Caminantes. 
this is Explorers. No, it's Fort River Elementary School that may have two things running in it, but it, it doesn't run that way. It really does not run that way. Herb. Well, um, first of all, um, just, I have a loved one who's in the uh, Common Estates program. It's her second year. And, you know, I've always admired that program. Uh, however, I do appreciate your analysis and your way of delving into it. I think that's something that it has has been and is necessary. Whoop. Did I go off? No, you no you're there. Fine. I'm sure. All right. So anyway, um, I'm, I, I really like that program. The other thing is I, I should have said in, uh, in terms of a school committee uh, um, announcements is that I went to uh, Fort River Open House and it was extraordinary in terms of the numbers of parents and kids who were there. Uh, and it's, it was actually the second year that I've done this and I'm always amazed at the turnout. I know that one year, the last year was like over a 95% turnout. I assume it was the same thing this year. It was, I, so I want to just applaud the uh, Fort River community because they're obviously are really, really engaged parents, uh, not only for the Commonalities program, for, but for Fort River in and of itself. Okay, Bridget. I would. I, I wanted to say oh, I agree. Sorry. No, that's fine. I agree, Irv. Um, I met the PTA president. She's a really sweet individual. I think that there is a whole lot of great things happening at Fort River. Um, we had a librarian meeting. I had a meeting with all of the librarians, and um, the Fort River librarian shared with me that last year um, the fifth graders were actually published in a book of poems. And so I'm waiting, we're gonna have an announcement come out about that. So there's great things happening in Fort River. Um, there, there's great things happening in all our schools, but yes, there are great things happening in Fort River. And I do, I wanna make it clear. I don't, I, I, I mean, I think the program is valuable. I think there provides a lot of positives for our students. I just also don't want to be unrealistic with where we are at and the things that we would have to do to improve upon how the program is being done. And I think the pushback comes in is that everyone thinks it's fine the way it is, but there are there's always things when, when you're asking questions or you're looking into things that maybe we haven't delved as deep as possible, but um, I'm delving as deeply as I can be. All right, Bridget. I think I would pretty much echo what Jennifer said and I, I like um, a few other people in the room, I can't be completely neutral about this. I was on the committee and part of a group of parents who are pushing from um, you know many, many years back to try and get dual language immersion into our schools before the Chinese charter school was even founded. And I do feel like if our district had been faster, we probably would have lost less families. So. I feel like the program is really important to those sort of enrollment dynamics that we have. And then it's also really important for um, making groups of students who we see later on and when we're looking at things through a regional lens are feeling disengaged from school. But here is a place where they're so engaged and they feel so much like they belong. So um, I do think one question that always occurred to me with dual language and I Again, I have that original bias and my very first job out of college was in a dual um, language kindergarten. So um, so I'm really attached to it, but I always wondered, is it possible? Is it something we could do for all children? You know, so, um, so I wanna think bigger and just put out there that I wouldn't be at all supportive of eliminating it, but I would be totally supportive of expanding it somehow so that there wasn't that feeling of division among so I, our students, but especially, Bridget, yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, I don't know where anyone got the elimination from. Yeah. That's, that's the, so that's the part, right? Because I'm, and that's what I'm saying, because I'm not saying something the way that everyone wants me to say it, if it makes them feel like she's trying to get rid of it, that's not it. I'm trying to be realistic with how do we, and that's why I'm like, program sustainability is a consideration. 
How do we sustain it and possibly expand it? Because dual language programs actually provide a benefit once well implemented, once sustained. But if it is not sustained, then we have a gap. The issue is how do we sustain it in the current environment that we have? How do we take what we have identified as cons thus far and switch them into pros, but it's going to take some work. So I actually have seen where, and in the research, we're different, even here in Massachusetts, different schools throughout the nation have shown where they cannot run the program as a program because it is a school of its own. So they have taken that model and created a full school. So those and that those full school models are the ones that are the most successful nationwide because it is difficult to run it the way how it is being run currently. And so a lot of them that has this, like a lot of the programs that have been disbanded or have been cut or not like when you look at the research, it's because they've tried to implement the model that we currently have long term and it does not work. It is not sustainable. So it is best sustainable when it is its own school. Are we there yet? I haven't finished the research. It's like we're, we're still researching to see what that would take and what that would look like. But again, not because I talk about and maybe that's me. These are the things I'm seeing. These doesn't mean that there aren't ways to expand on it. There aren't those ways. I've never said, let's cut the whole thing and throw the baby out with the bathwater. Never said that. I said, these are the things that I'm seeing. This is the things that need to be addressed. But there are a lot of pros. We just need to implement it in a way that's sustainable and that all, everyone is supportive and that the school can run as one school building. Yeah. <clears throat> Hi. Um. Yeah, I'm a little confused about having this conversation piecemeal. The last time I knew it was an agenda piece on the Amherst School Committee agenda, uh, we had a presentation from Katie Richardson. We discussed, um, ex it was in June. Um, so we discussed and approved, I believe, 5-0 expanding or changing the focus from a 50-50 model to a 90-10 model. Um, so I don't really know where the criticism or concerns are coming from, but I would just like to say, if we wanna talk about Comenantes as a whole, let's do it as an agenda piece and let's bring in all the pieces of information we have, but, um, there's no reason to think that we are being asked to um, make a commitment that we've already made. And there's no reason to believe that we're changing direction and, and certainly not with hearsay and information from other school committee meetings. So I, I just feel like this conversation is um, not well, to, not, sorry, I were home. I just don't see where this is coming from. Um, and I'd like to, to, to develop it in a thorough and systematic way. If, if we need to, if that's what's being asked of us. Dr. Z, did you make this presentation in response to the email? <laughs> Perhaps. I, so not not just the email. I, I have received questions, concerns, all, all these things. But Deb, where it comes from is the fact that I believe one of our earlier Amherst meetings, and I'm like, it's, I stated that Fort River is literally running two schools within a building, right? Okay. And, you know, it's a problem that must be addressed. It is. It is a problem. Um, but I want you to know that your comment just now where you're talking about you, you, you looked at the common antis model and you shift from 90, 10 and, and all these things and those things that were done. That is what I'm speaking about when I said it's actually like running two completely different buildings or not even build like the building is Fort River, right? 
I would like for, for, for maybe for you to walk through a presentation on Fort River and how Fort River operates. And then from that vantage point, seeing their schedule, seeing what it looks like, maybe from that vantage point, it could kind of create why it is for me a little bit of a concern. And I think the concern that comes in and why this is why this is um, coming forward is because I've been talking about the school building as a whole, the school community as a whole. And individuals are hearing me talking about Fort River as a whole. And it's like, but is she trying to get rid of coming? No, I'm talking about how can Fort River as a whole function where they have these two completely, and I and if I could find from the data presentations where, you know, Tammy was able to show her schedule and just share that. And so maybe that'll give a glimpse into where some of this is coming from. But it literally, even in the presentation, I had to tell Tammy as the principal that you, you're not even aware of how you are presenting this and it's coming off as Tammy presented Fort River and all of these things that's happening. And then there was a portion where, um, I wanna bring the schedule up real quick. I need to kind of copy this out. But um, there was a portion where the, you know, Katie presented on Caminantes. But in actuality, Tammy is the principal of the whole building. And so what I'm trying to say is that we I just needed to be, and it's not intentional, it's how it is structured that provides that. And so that's that's the concerning part. I think that everyone is kind of concerned about. And if you give me one minute, Sarah, I know that- Well, Earth I, I actually, I actually, I, I know there's much more to say and I'm sure we will have continue this conversation, but I'd actually like to move on. We have okay. a lot. So Irv, you've already ha <laughs> had a comment. I'm sorry. I, I really think we need, we've got some other big um, matters to address. Um, okay. So we hear the public's concern and we hear your concerns and um, this is only the beginning of a discussion of, of the, I'm sure with the, the future, like what next year is gonna look like. So, um, Irv, do you mind? <laughs> Your hand's still up, is it? Yeah, I just, I just, I just seen saw this as a superintendent's up, update. I didn't think we were this was any kind of discussion on the common is pro program and all. And no, we don't, question, yeah. These were just followed up questions. It was right. not we're, intended to be that kind of discussion. Right. We're not taking any action. We've not. Yeah, the, the committee is not doing anything about common <laughs> at this meeting. All right. So I just wanted to update the community on what I'm looking at, because I think there was a lot of question around that. And, and I, I, I wanted to clarify, like, you know, coming in upon entry, what are some of the findings? What are the pros and the cons? And that I'm not trying to cut a program. I am trying to one, look at a, a as a whole community, how does Fort River function? And more so what needs to happen for it to function safely. Whether that means it needs to expand and just be a bilingual school, then maybe that's it. Maybe it doesn't need to be a bilingual school. What needs to happen? And what needs to happen in the next two years that we are switching to a building that is K-5? Right. Thank, and thank you for doing that. These emails, the public comments started coming in and I figured there, there must have been something, <laughs> something to provoke the concern. All right, so the next uh, item on our agenda is to approve hopefully approve the minutes of our September meeting. Um, do any committee members have edits to request? Please put up your hand if so. I don't see any. So I will move that we accept the minutes, the draft minutes of September 17th, 2024 as final. Is there a second? Second, Jennifer. Thank you. This has to be a roll call vote. So Bridget? Yes. Deb? Yes. Irv? Yes. Jennifer? Yes. And I'm a yes, thank you. Okay. All right, so I would now like to reopen um, 
the public comment period for not more than 10 minutes. So I would ask people who've already spoken not to raise your hand uh, yet and let's give any of the many people in attendance the opportunity. All right, Nicholas, I can't see the, Burgos, please unmute yourself and give us your name, assuming I assume that's your name uh, and where you live, and then you have up to three minutes. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes, I think you're not. Okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm actually not Nicholas Burgos. My name is Rachel. Um, I'm using my husband's Zoom. Um, so I actually wanted to speak on behalf of 80 Acres. I'm an employee, but I'm also a parent of a child who is within um, the 80 Acres educational system. Um, so this will be relatively brief, but as a licensed special education teacher in both the Holyoke and South Hadley public schools, respectively, I feel that I can speak to both sides of the coin. Um, that said, I really can't emphasize the value of education offered to the students at 80 Acres. The children at the school never cease to amaze me with their emotional maturity and their willingness, willingness to explore the world around them. They are profoundly creative, wildly intelligent and resilient young people, and I will be proud to hand my future down to them. The teachers are warm, they're loving, they're talented, and they're unbelievably qualified to shape the future of our community and our world. And, and our world. Offering students of color a safe space to learn, explore, and come into themselves as individuals is necessary to create the Amherst we proudly came to be. So I hope we can walk the walk the same way we talk the talk. I implore the board to take a close look at the values Amherst strives towards alongside the values that 80 Acres practices and approve the public, the private, sorry, the private school. Um, thank you so much. Thank you, please I'll mute you. Okay. John Bilderbeck, did you speak earlier? I don't remember. Please unmute yourself. I, I did speak earlier. I will see oh. my time um, and uh, take, my, take my discussion offline. Thank you, thank you. You can always send in a written comment to scpublickcomment at arps.org. Thank you. Um, next is Ayumi. Please unmute yourself uh, and give us your full name and where you live. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Hi, uh, my name is Ayumi Parsons and I live in Amherst and I am vice president of 80 Acres as an organization focusing, um, my focus is on education team, but I'm here today hoping to speak as a parent of a student at 80 Acres. Um, our two older children attend schools within the district, um, while our youngest is enrolled at the 80 Acres Homeschool Cooperative. We, cho we chose to enroll our youngest at 80 Acres because of its nurturing environment and relationship-based approach, which honors each student's uniqueness and individuality, fostering a holistic understanding of them as a whole human being. In contracts, um, contrast, as um, our children Older children have recently been vocal about the persistent anti-Asian sentiments they encounter on a regular basis at their ARP schools. Um, <clears throat> despite their inherent sense of justice and confidence, they have chosen not to share these experiences with us for a long time, opting instead to confront these challenges alone in hopes that silence might quell the negativity. As a parent, we value the opportunity to make a choice as to where to send our children. 80 Acres School offers our children opportunities to feel safe, acknowledged, and celebrated for the humanity our children bring to, um, our child brings to her learning community. I hope this school become more available to others in the community, just as it has been a great fit for our child. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so that concludes public comment. Um, Sarah, so it, there are actually two more people. How come I don't? All right, thank you. Uh, I don't know why they don't go shoot to the top of my list, but Georgia, will you please unmute yourself and then tell us your full name, where you live, and then you have up to three minutes. 
Um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, my name is Georgia Malcolm. I work at the high school and I live in South Hadley, but I work, you know, clearly work in the district. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. I'm a little bit confused by the 80 acres. I really think it's quite inappropriate. <laughs> I mean, we're trying to, Dr. Z is new. I'm also the president of the Amherst Pelham Educators Association. I'm a black woman from Jamaica. So when people talk about social justice and people of color, I'm right up there. Um, so Dr. Z is new, right? I think she just got to her hundredth day. And what I can say unapologetically is that she's very open. She's transparent, the union. We're not playing games with her. We have honest conversations. We, ha we ask her to do a Q&A because people have questions about the budget. She has agreed to that. So I would suggest to those people from Fort River who have questions about Caminantes or whatever questions they have, they can reach out to her office and I'm sure she'll be more than happy to have a meeting with them. But this is what happens in Amherst. People talk and talk and things get out and everything gets all misconstrued. You know, another thing is, I mean, Dr. Z inherited a mess, a financial mess, a colossal mess that it's not gonna happen overnight. She's rebuilding, the foundation is totally decimated and she's having to rebuild from scratch. So I would just ask that people give her the chance they give the white people. Here's a black woman that's coming in and people aren't gonna like the change, but I would really appreciate that people give her the courtesy that they give previous administration who really wasn't doing squat. Thank you. Thank you, Georgia. Next, Brianna O, please unmute yourself and give us your full name and where you live and then you have up to three minutes. Hi, my name is Brianna Owen and I live in North Amherst. I'm here to speak on behalf of the 80 Acres Co-op School. Um, 80 Acres is a wonderful school for students to learn curriculum rooted in racial and climate justice. Um, as somebody that works at 80 Acres and as somebody who has volunteered at the school, I have firsthand witnessed the growth of students and got to see how the school's innovative curriculum teaches kids about the land, social justice, and how they intertwine. 80 Acres School is filled with caring educators who are constantly going the extra mile to make sure all our kids can dream big. I hope you all move forward with moving the school application forward tonight because it would be a mistake not to. Like Rachel said earlier, I hope that we can walk the walk the same way that we talk the talk when we think about the opportunity for students in the community. Thank you. Thank you. And one final comment, because that'll be 10 minutes. Sharon Kearney, I think, please unmute yourself. Give us your name if that's not your name and where you live, and then you have three minutes. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Actually, sorry, this is Sharon's husband, Cahill, and we're both here. Um, Sharon has already submitted a public comment and we'll try and keep our comments brief. Uh, we're just very much in support of the Caminantes program. We have two kids that have had an extremely positive experience in the program and, and a third one uh, hopefully joining in the next uh, couple of years. Uh, I guess I just without kind of going over kind of stuff that's already been said, I think the one thing that, that has raised the anxiety is we haven't heard uh, before tonight or tonight, just an explicit commitment to work with Fort River, to work with the Caminantes family, to make sure that the program is successful and sustainable. The parents are obviously invested and, and are willing to do what's needed. But I think just hearing that from the committee and hearing that from Dr. Uh, G would, um, would, would put everyone's anxieties at rest. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. All right. So now we're done with public comment. Of course, we always take written comment and we'll move to new business. I'll invite Adrian Wallace to turn on her camera and her mic. Um, and before I turn the floor over to her, I, I just wanna tell the committee and the, and the, um, the public that uh, Ms. Wallace first reached out to us in, in late June and we don't meet in the summer. And since then we've been caught up in trying to figure out how do we do this because it's such a rare, <laughs> a rare request of the school committee. And I felt that our way forward as a committee would just become a lot clearer if she made her presentation to us. And we would, we would know what it was um, we're being asked to approve. 
So uh, Ms. Wallace sent in um, a, a document which has been posted on board docs. I'm sure the committee has seen. I will now ask you, Ms. Wallace, to go ahead and make your presentation. Do you Point want to show order. the document or just speak? I'm sorry, Jennifer. Just I'm sorry, point of order, sorry to interrupt. Um, could you just explain again <laughs> to, for the members of the committee and for the public, why we're even doing this? Like, what is it that compels us to be hearing from a private school that wants to open in the town? There is a mass general law uh, stating that school committees must give approval um, or not, but, but any private school that wishes to open in a town must get the approval from the school, the school committee in the town where it's gonna operate regardless of where the students in that school come from. And, and sorry, can and I- we are to, And sorry, and, no, and the, the law says we are to evaluate. I don't have, it's in our policy LBC that we um, need to determine, make our determination on the basis of the curriculum and whether it's um, um, equal in, in Efficiency and, and thoroughness and efficiency. Thoroughness, thank you, thank you. Thoroughness and in efficient and efficiency to that offered in the public school. So it is it is traditional to hear give the petitioner um, a chance to explain uh, uh, what it is uh, her group wants to do. So and I gather there already is a school in existence. Must not be in Amherst. So um, perhaps we'll learn about that too. So thank you, go ahead. Thank you, Sarah, and thank you, members of the committee. Um, my name is Adrienne Wallace Esquire. I am here to share with you about um, 80 Acres uh, Climate Justice Cooperative School and our desire to operate a private school in Amherst. Right now, we operate a homeschool cooperative um, and we are really excited to have the opportunity to operate as a private school because that opens our ability to seek accreditation, to seek um, athletic opportunities that would otherwise not be available for our students. So those are the main reasons why we've submitted an application. Am I able to um, share my screen? You should be um, able to. Okay. Yes, uh, well, seeing somebody, there you go. Yep. Okay. Just going to change to full view. And is that your full screen or can you see other items? I'm not, I can't tell. Shall we see your tabs at the top and some? Okay, there we go. Yeah. Um, wonderful. Okay, this is the vision of 80 Acres. We believe that all students should have the opportunity to learn in their natural environment. And also we believe that those are matters of climate and racial justice. So again, we have a legal obligation to present our case for operating as a private school to the school committee so that we can um, operate within the bounds of the law as a private school. So just to share a little bit about our grounding before I jump into explaining our curriculum, we are grounded in the principles of the Black Panther Party's 10 point plan informed by decades of climate research um, and committed to advocating for black liberation each day. All sorts of people can do that. Um, and we strive to nurture and educate the minds that will create the solutions for climate change, um, which is necessary now more than ever and build beloved community in the vision of Dr. King. Our comprehensive curriculum is taught in alignment with black American culture within a supportive and empowering community. Just to underscore briefly, climate justice is absolutely a Black American cultural value. So <clears throat> as you can see, Black Americans are more likely to be alarmed or concerned about global warming and climate change than our white counterparts. And that's because we know we are disproportionately likely to be harmed by the impacts of climate justice. And we have a different cultural value in, um, in community with the land. So just to reiterate um, exactly what Sarah was just talking about, the standard of review for private schools in Massachusetts is set by the compulsory attendance law, attendance law that's Mass General Law, uh, Chapter 76, Section 1. And this law requires school committees to approve private schools when and if they are satisfied that the instruction is as thorough and efficient as the instruction in public schools in the same town. Just again, to reiterate and underscore, the school committee approval does not mean that the school committee either endorses or evaluates the program quality of the school. It is simply examining its thoroughness and efficiency to be in line with that of the instruction in the public schools. At the end of the day, parents uh, are responsible for and should have as many opportunities to enroll their children in a school that aligns with their values and what matters to them. 
Um, and I have some wonderful news for you, committee. You actually already approved 80 Acres Climate Justice Cooperative Schools curriculum because we have a number of students in Amherst who have submitted homeschool applications, which have all been approved, each and every one, along with surrounding districts. You've actually taken a look at both the thoroughness and the effectiveness of our program and deemed it to be sufficient. Um, that happens every time a student wants to be homeschooled. For those uh, who are listening who may not be aware, you have to submit a homeschool plan to the district, which then can approve or reject that plan. And each time a student um, who has participated in our program has submitted a plan uh, to Amherst, it's been approved. Also, just as a, as a small note, the last private school that was approved in Amherst was approved by the regional school committee, and that happened in 2020. So not entirely new to the process. Um, Happy to send you the notes or show you the video pulled from that meeting. At any rate, to jump into the thoroughness and efficiency of our curriculum, we use a couple uh, proprietary that are not proprietary to us, but proprietary to other organizations. Um, we use Wild Math as a foundational math program, and I will um, share some samples of that momentarily. Um, for ELA, we use Fish Tank, uh, which is literature based, literature forward. Um, program. We also use uh, Project Learning Tree for our science which focuses on environmental education through outdoor experiences. And for history, we use a people's curriculum uh, for the earth. These are all research backed and supported uh, curricular opportunities for students. Um, for our art, PE and music, our teacher designed um, so that they can integrate elements across the curriculum um, that are culturally relevant. And uh, important, all of that lays on top of our framework which is a pedagogy for liberation from Paulo Freire, which again, emphasizes empowering students as active participants in their own learning, not the bucket model, the community model, um, and making sure that students are engaged in environmental responsibility. This is a little bit about the why, and, and I'll just sort of narrate over this briefly while I share with the committee that all of these things are in the application uh, packet that I submitted. I wanted to give you a hard copy of this lovely 29 page document, but um, I trust that y'all will consider it digitally. So our curriculum, our math curriculum specifically looks at math in an outdoor relevant way and what that looks like as students are learning, for example, um, base 10, that can be represented by leaves, sticks, and trees that they've collected and found. Now, perhaps that doesn't sound like a real significant difference, but actually being able to see how numbers matter, how scale matters, how trees expand, how they fall at certain angles, and how that is a, a right triangle is actually really informative to how students are able to understand the world around them and to actually be able to integrate what sometimes when they're written on a white board just look like concepts into their actual practical everyday stand, uh, understanding. It's one thing to say a tri triangle is the strongest shape. It's another thing to build a house out of a triangle. Mm -hmm. uh, with respect to our English language arts curriculum, we use a literature first curriculum because we believe it gives our students an opportunity to not only do build their literacy skills and to focus on critical thinking, but it also allows them to really build their own identity and to understand the identities of others. Our science curriculum, again, we use Project Learning Tree, connects science to social justice, empowering students to think critically about climate issues that disproportionately affect their communities. So we use a, a broad approach, again, all research backed, all um, either Common Core or Massachusetts curriculum framework aligned. Um, for history, we use a people's curriculum for the earth, which is rooted in environmental justice and covers global histories of resistance. Art and music, again, teacher design, but rich in Black cultural traditions. One element is African storytelling, which has been a really powerful opportunity for our students to gauge in learning about oral histories and oral forms of communication. Um, and again, that's all grounded in our liberatory uh, framework, which comes from a pedagogy for liberation. Uh, we also have um, a social and emotional learning teacher who meets with each group of students every day. And we have individual learning plans. So each student has the opportunity to have an individual learning plan that focuses on both their strengths and where they need to grow. So we don't have a need to have an IEP for every student because effectively every student has an individual plan tailored directly around their skills and their needs. Now, I'll just note too for the committee that we are a micro school, right? The reason why we're able to do these things is that we're really small. Um, right now, we're up, we operate um, and invite K through four homeschool cooperative students. Um, and our vision is, and I'll talk a little bit more about our vision in a moment. But um, as uh, as Reed mentioned, our class sizes are small. We're not intending to be a large school. Our goal is to really be a micro school, so we can continue this very individualized, um, but also community based approach. 
relevant to our application are our uh, perspectives on education, educator, excuse me, qualifications. We really care about somebody being able to teach. It doesn't matter to us whether or not you have uh, 75 different credentials in education or have passed all of your MTELs. What matters to us is that you can actually demonstrate that you can help young people learn, whether that is from experience as a licensed educator, as a homeschool parent, a coach, community tutor, um, whatever that experience is, as long as you can demonstrate the ability to successfully teach students, um, then we are interested in your candidacy as a teacher. We also require that our teachers be uh, have cultural awareness and responsiveness so that they can demonstrate an understanding of the strengths of our student community, which is um, diverse and, and very powerful, amazing group of students. Um, we seek educators who respect and integrate Black culture and history into their teaching. It's also important that our teachers be committed to climate justice and social responsibility, as well as committed to flexibility and innovation in education. Because we work with children, obviously safety is also important um, and background checks are an important part of our uh, commitment to keeping all of our students safe, cared for and held. Um, I'm just gonna again, narrate over this. I've talked about in the application too, why some of these things are really important, but I just wanna step back to, to sort of emphasize something that Ayumi said. There are a number of things that the Amherst schools do incredibly well. I think their ability to <clears throat> like share curricular resources with students help, uh, I'm sorry, with teachers, help teachers understand their teaching and how it connects to grade levels is really quite second to none. I think where there is room to go, to grow is with respect to anti-racist and culturally responsive pedagogy. All we offer is another option for parents who are seeking something else. Um, it doesn't mean, um, and also there's mutual opportunities to learn. For example, 80 Acres actually operates programs in partnership with the high school um, and with the middle school because we believe that climate change um, and racial injustice impact all of us. And our goal is to really be a solution to those problems. And we can't do that without community. With the Under the auspices of our school, of course, we're teaching directly ultimately 20 or so students in that space, but that doesn't mean that we aren't invested in the community and also operating as an important part of it. Uh, just to share a little bit about our long-term educational vision, we are seeking to operate at the end of the day, a K through eight school. We are only seeking um, permission to operate right now, a K through four school. As we expand, we will continue to seek uh, the permissions that are required by law from the committee. We would like to operate a small climate high school, and one day, even the climate college. <laughs> um, I'm gonna share uh, some curriculum samples. I pulled them up on my screen. Okay, this is when my like millennial struggles are gonna be very obvious to everyone. I'm so sorry. No, that's the wrong, that's the wrong tab. There we go. So this is a, um, I would love to be able to share the entire curriculum with the committee. However, because they're proprietary materials, I'm not able to do that. This is a selection from Fish Tank, which is where our ELA curriculum comes from. Um, and as you can see the standards listed here, uh, these are the same standards that you'll see listed in both the Common Core and in the Massachusetts curriculum framework. So I believe the first standard for um, language is, is almost identical in how it's written here. There are some small, small differences, but nothing substantive. Um, and all of those align and um, Fish Tank is happy to share their alignment with Massachusetts curriculum frameworks. I'm not able to do that on their behalf again because it's pri pri proprietary, excuse me, but you can see um, that those standards are well aligned. Um, when you consider and look at, uh, these are the uh, the standards from the Massachusetts curriculum. You can see that the first standard is almost exactly the same, almost identical, um, <clears throat> excuse me. And when you look at our math, this is our math curriculum. This is from Wild Math. For example, you can look here and see that uh, standard accounting under counting cardinality and place value number 20 is count forward starting at any number. And I believe the Massachusetts curriculum framework is K, I wanna say it's KCCA1, um, which is identical. And then uh, just another example, uh, under addition and subtraction, um, adding and subtracting up to five plus five is identical in the Massachusetts curriculum frameworks. I believe it's KCCOA5, um, could be six, I think it's five, but these are the same exact standards that you'll find um, in the Massachusetts curriculum frameworks. Again, everything's all well aligned and we're making sure that our students should, we'd love for them to stay with us forever, but should they return to public school, um, we're ensuring that they have the skills necessary uh, to do so. 
So um, just to give uh, the committee a, an overview of what's in our application, you'll find again our letter of application, curriculum overview, our teacher qualifications, uh, a brief site overview, happy to provide more information, but aware also that this is a public forum um, and would prefer to pr provide those opportunities for the committee to get to know a little bit about more our about our site um, offline for security reasons. Um, and you'll find some sort of underlying notes that are important to us about climate justice, education, um, and black liberation. So I'm gonna close and you know, I understand that this meeting is um, long and it's the evening. So I'm gonna close and open up to any questions that the committee may have. I just wanna like remind and bring to the front of really grounding and that thoroughness and effective standard. Um, and I would be really, really happy to answer questions and be responsive to whether or not our curriculum is thorough, our curriculum is thorough and efficient as that of the public schools, which again, the committee has already said that it is. Um, and then really would encourage the committee to offer the opportunity, right? Give us, give us the chance to offer the opportunity to parents and parents can make the decision that they wanna make um, as the stewards of their children. So thank you again for taking the time to listen and I'm happy to respond to your questions. Thank you. I think we'll first take um, questions from committee members to Adrian. And then we'll excuse her and have some time for discussion about how we want to proceed. All right. Um, so, Jennifer. Thanks. Hi, Adrian. Um, thanks for that presentation. Can you give some examples of the ways that your curriculum is accessible to students with special needs? Sure, and that would be a really appropriate question for you to ask if you were a parent considering enrolling your student, because that is also relatively clearly outside of the scope of what's required to approve um, the school. But I will tell you that because we're small and because, and, and I'm happy to tell you because I'm really proud of it, but I, I do want to just underscore that I think it's outside of the, the scope of what's required for approval. Um, Again, because we have individual learning plans for each student, we're able to help each student get access to what they need to be a successful learner at 80 Acres. Um, again, above and beyond an individual education plan, uh, an individualized learning plan highlights each student's skills, each necessary, uh, necessary areas for growth and provides a roadmap that they'll need to actually be successful. So we do that for every student. And some students, for example, may have a complicated home situation that doesn't require a diagnosis, but actually means they need something a little bit different in that moment. Students may have different language needs. Students may have different um, skills that they were taught in the past or things that they want to move beyond. So because we offer individualized learning plans, we're able to tailor our curriculum, instruction, um, and resources to exactly what not only that student, but also what that family needs. Can I chime in um, and say, Adrian, I think you told me, it must have been in an email that 80 Acres does not offer special education services. And if you wanted to do that, it would be Desi who would have to approve your, your plan for special ed services. Is that correct? That is correct, which doesn't mean that we don't offer opportunities for all students, like for example, a student who uh, has dyslexia. Let's just use that as an example. Um, we That doesn't mean that we uh, remove that student. That means we offer them what they need through their individualized learning plan. But just again, like enforcement of the ADA is outside of the scope of this committee. The committee needs to follow the ADA, but the committee does not enforce or have the ability to execute any enforcement power with respect to the ADA and how that's administered. Um, and with respect to special, ed special education, if we wanted to be approved as a special ed program or a special education school, that would indeed have to be done through DESI. Right. Herb. Um, Adrian, thank you for submitting a really good application. I mean, it's was thorough. I didn't. I uh, would like to say that going through it took some time, <laughs> but I I did enjoy going through it, uh, and so I, I applaud you for that. Uh, one question: How many students uh, will you have initially, or do you have? Um, I believe we will have eleven students initial in our initial K through four um, chunk of students. All right. Good enough. So anyway, I applaud you for doing this. And as a person who was a founding teacher of a new school, uh, I do know that it is incredibly uh, not only um, exhilarating, but exhausting. Uh, but it's well worth it. And so I uh, wish you well. 
thank you. And I'm long-winded. I, I, there's nothing I can do about that one, but thank you. <laughs> no, information, information is good. Um, Bridget and Irv, you can put your hand up. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you um, so much, Adrian. I, I'm really excited about the school and what you're bringing forward. Um, it's so important, I think, the hands-on learning at those younger ages for like integrating and processing the knowledge and um, to have it so culturally embedded as well. And then climate forward, like I'm, uh, I'm really um, just really glad that you're that you're taking this under and that some students are already receiving um, the benefit of this. I have two questions and I'll just put them out there. The first one is just like in Googling, <laughs> I saw that you'd had approval in 2021 from the Northampton school. So I'm just wondering what happened with that school or that type of thing. Um, and I'll give you my second question at the same time. So you can just answer them on your own, which is like, we have that period, like K through four early learning, it's so crucial for students. And I think you've got all the building blocks in place there, unless a student is bumping into something like you mentioned dyslexia or something like that. And I do think to meet that thorough and efficient standard, we'd want to see like, what are your plans for evaluating, not necessarily supporting, but referral, referring for, um, for testing, et cetera, because if you run into a student like that, our district is still responsible for providing some services and um, figuring out together with you how to support the student if they stay at your school. Yeah, absolutely. We, um, I'll answer your second question first. So we've already worked um, with the district in the under the um, umbrella of our homeschool cooperative with the district on particular plans for particular students with respect to um, any needs indicated on an IEP or 504. We uh, will continue to do so. And we also work with some partner organizations who either have uh, specialties in a particular area, like working specifically with students with autism, or um, if we need something more uh, broad based and we say, hey, this student may need evaluation. We, we're not exactly sure what's going on, but it looks like there are maybe some underlying concerns that we want to address. So we've worked with the district already in our, uh, and have formed some partnerships to be able to diagnose um, and get, offer support for specific things, um, specifically around autism in this, with this most recently formed partnership. Um, with respect to your first question, which Remind me what that was. Just give me North, one. Northampton. Thank you. With Northampton. Thank you. So many things going on here. Uh, we were actually, yeah, we were approved in Northampton. And then do you know that my staff primarily live in Amherst? And they said, Adrian, we are not driving across the bridge every day. And so they made me drive across the bridge every day. Um, so for that reason, we we relocate we relocated. We found out a lot of our students that were interested, um, a lot of our parents. Um, and a lot of our staff actually were Amherst residents. And so at that point, it made more sense for me to drive over the bridge than to have everybody else go uh, the reverse way. They're both terrible in the morning, by the way. This is, there's no winning. Yeah, yeah. All right. Um, I have I have several questions and then committee members may have more. So there are just some things I want to understand. You are already teaching according to this model, but under the rubric of a homeschool cooperative and you just want to reclassify it essentially as a private school is that correct that's correct we want to operate as a private school because it opens up athletic opportunities for our students they can compete against other private schools um, and it also op opens up the opportunity for particular grants like if we want to take the students to the smithsonian um, if we operate as a private school we have different opportunities to be able to do that than if we are not are you changing your curriculum in any way to support your application to be a private school? Or is that this is what you do now? <laughs> no, this is what we do now. Okay. Um, I'm, I, I, I heard you say, and, and I just want to be absolutely certain that you're applying to be a K through four school. Is that right? Because you're that is, yeah. at K three and you wanted to go to K five, but... So if so, you are asking for approval just for K to four, which means, and if you get that, and if you want to add grades, you will need to reapply to do that. 
So yeah, we would need, my understanding is that we would need to do a notification process. Mm -hmm. um, and then if the committee has questions, they would be permitted to ask. We, I do understand that we have to apply if we want to add things that would need to be submitted to the regional uh, committee. So if we wanted to operate as a middle school. Well, that's the interesting thing because it seems, and, and maybe it was different during the pandemic when children weren't attending school in person, but it's our reading of the law that the regional committee has has no role because a school has to be approved by the town's school committee, wherever it is operating. So there is no town called regional. You know, it's like if you wanted to have a school in Leverett, you go to the Leverett school committee, even if it had eighth graders in it. So is it's our under, our belief that as long as you wish to operate in Amherst, no matter how many grades or what grades, you would be coming to us. Yeah, that's an interesting reading. I would be happy to talk to Attorney Terry about um, about those concerns, but I would also say that those aren't particularly relevant at the moment because we are only seeking to operate K through four. Right. I'm just harking back to you said that the region had done this and that, but again, maybe during they did and during um, the pandemic, September twenty second, twenty twenty. Right, which was yeah. during the pan during remote learning. So it was yeah. may have been yes a, a, a different process then. Um, uh, Deb. You're muted. Thank you. I'm sorry. Um, I enjoyed reading the packet. I found it interesting and creative. Um, and I had a series of questions. One, uh, do you want them like all up front or one at a time? Um, all up front is totally okay. fine. One of the things you had said in your in your letter is that you were hoping for a timely turnaround. So I was wondering what that turnaround you were hoping for looks like. Um, the homeschool approval and the Northampton approval of the curriculum, I feel like is is a great jumping off point for us because uh, we're required, as you know, to make sure that the curriculum as presented align with the, the mass standards, which you showed us part of, but I wondered how that's handled with the homeschooling students or the Northampton students, how that particular issue was addressed. Um, when when those curricula were approved by those, well, one by our district and one by the Northampton district. Um, and then the part that I'm struggling with and look also welcome your input on, as well as uh, Attorney Terry's, is the part from Desi that gave us guidance as to what we were looking for um, and it said compliance with applicable federal and state laws. So I'm not really sure where they're going with that. You said, and it makes sense to me that the um, special education part of that is beyond our purview. So what um, what can you tell us about that particular uh, line in the DESE guidance that would um, direct me? And that, that's all I have. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I counted four. So I will go in order. Um, with respect to timely turnaround, I mean, I think uh, ASAP. And the reason I'm saying that is because we've already been approved by the district. So it would it would feel a little silly, really, honestly, to say the, the uh, courts have said that the standard for thoroughness and, and effectiveness should be similar to that used to evaluate homeschool plans. So it's a, it would be hard to imagine what would be so fundamentally different from an application that was submitted over the summer to by a homeschool parent to this application now. Um, with respect to our uh, the homeschool approval piece, uh, that those are submitted independently by parents that were reflecting on our curriculum and how our school works um, and were subsequently approved by the district. Um, and also I'll just note that 
um, with respect to how those processes worked in Northampton, there does not have to be alignment exactly with the Massachusetts standards. It just has to be equal in its thoroughness and effectiveness. Um, we think we've demonstrated that. I think I've demonstrated that in the application materials as set forward, um, but I'm happy to provide and with permission of any of the curricular providers, uh, more in-depth samples, I'm happy to provide a, like a narrative of what our class structures look like. You'll see even in the application materials, there's an example about our schedule um, and I'm happy to provide any lesson samples as, as long as that's okay by the proprietors. I also think like, again, as you mentioned, it is a strong jumping off point that a similar district located not too far away, also in Massachusetts has approved our curriculum. Um, and again, the district has done so itself with respect to the legal requirements and compliance, you know, I'll say this, unless the committee does something, you know, approves something. And I want to be really careful here because I am a lawyer, so I'm not giving anybody legal advice. I'm not providing legal advice to the committee. You should speak to Attorney Terry for that. Um, but my my understanding and my interpretation um, of that piece of, of the DESI guidance is really about making sure that um, schools aren't doing something sort of egregious in their application materials. With respect to if the school should ever do something illegal contrary to any federal law, that would then be the under the enforcement power, right? A parent can bring that up and say, hey, this is happening at the school. This is unfair. Bring that to DESE or bring that to any of the other enforcement bodies that exist within the state or the uh, federal government. And they can they can pull something forward. Um, with respect to actively sort of monitoring our ability to implement the ADA or immigration law or any of those pieces would be, I think, far outside both the school committee's purview, but also comfort level. Like, I hope y'all are not feeling like we got to enforce federal law here. Um, but anyway, again, I, as an attorney, my best advice is to speak to yours about what those specific concerns might be. Thank you. Dr. Z. Hi, good evening. Very interesting and, and thorough conversation um, and presentation. I had a couple of things, especially coming in July 1. Um, and I'm hearing you repeatedly say that the, the district already approved it based on the homeschooling for the parents. And so for me, I have um, a concern and it's not directly towards this because I actually wanna say that the, the approach of your curriculum materials actually comes from real world application. Um, and the fact that that's actually what's how we're supposed to be applying learning consistently. Um, so I don't have the concerns around that. I have concerns around the consistency in the applic in the homeschool approval process and what grade levels were approved. If you have, if you are aware, um, because record keeping has not been the best, so we could find that. So if you have out of the grades that you're applying for versus the grades that were previously approved for homeschooling, and this is solely for my edification. Um, if you could, if you don't mind sharing that over, I don't mind sending the email um, because I'm trying, I just want to see for myself if it matches up some of the things that we found. Yes, I would be happy to share those. In the past, we applied for approval for uh, K through third. Uh, specifically in Amherst and no, the other one would have been, we had approval for additional grades, but that would have been in Northampton. So I will, I'm happy to send those over if you want to compare what we have in those materials um, to what's in our current application. Okay. Um, can, I, can I just check that I understand what just happened? Yours, Adrian, you're saying you submitted or the cooperative, homeschool cooperative submitted? No, what, what happens is for homeschooling, yeah. a parent applies towards the district. They submit their homeschooling plan and the district is supposed to send an approval to the parent whether it's approved or not. Since coming into to the district, I've, reached, I've only seen one package that has come in for this year. Um, and there hasn't been a standard policy set of approval in writing. And so the teaching and learning team has been working to develop that in terms of what that's clearly supposed to look like for, for the district. However, in, can I, is it okay to say Adrian? In Adrian's presentation, what she's pointed towards, which is, is a valid, which is valid is that 
the district has in the past approved the curricular in terms of based on the separate applications of, of parents. My question to her is based on her application this evening, what grade levels has this district approved for her, for not for her, but for the parents separately so that so that we can know, so I can, as we start to build out our homeschool data procedures and things, we can go back and see what grade levels have been approved. That's 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 what I'm I'm looking at. So I'm using a part of that to make sure that we're in alignment. Yeah, and that, just to record the response, it was uh, K through third. Right. That so hope parents received approval for homeschooling with these curricula for K, for one, for two, and for three, but not for four. Correct. Well, yeah, four would have been excluded, but it would have been included in other district: Palmer, Sunderland, Northampton. Right. And the mere fact that students each year do not have to reapply for homeschooling. Um, so basically, if a child was approved for third, um, they 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 are more than likely approved for fourth. Um, but again, we need to, those are policies that the policies or procedures that the district needs to put into place in terms of like a notice of intent and those types of things for homeschooling for the following year. That's a gap on our end, not on, on hers. Um, because those written policies are not standardized and in place. So I'm just trying to figure out what grade levels for, for our my edification. Thank you. I thought I'd seen another, Deb, had you had your hand up or no further questions from committee members? All right, in that case, we'll say thank you very much, Ms. Wallace for your presentation. Um, I think we'll now take a few minutes. Uh, as I had alerted you, we're, we're very unlikely to be voting to <laughs> voting tonight, um, and we we do have other things to get through. But um, I think it's safe to say that we will have this on the agenda for November. I mean, I would I would hope. That will be the case. And um, we'll be talking uh, in the next few minutes about how to proceed to get to the point where we can take a vote. I'm not Thank sure. you. I, I appreciate that. And my last and closing comment will just be that, you know, there are other private schools that operate in Amherst. And I understand that that process has somehow been lost to history, even though there was a private school approved in, in 20. 20. Um, and I would request again, like those private schools have the opportunity to operate. I think 80 acres should have just as much opportunity to operate um, as a private school. Our impact on the Amherst public schools is minimal. It's already happening, in fact. Um, and so I would argue that, you know, the committee uh, be encouraged to be as progressive and as open minded as possible and not make us face a harder process. Um, we're entering at a time where it's indicated to you, as Dr. Z said, right, like many of the processes need to be reconfigured or strengthened or whatever the case may be. But in our particular case, I don't think that we should be punished and have to wait and suffer because the committee wasn't aware of its legal obligation to um, to approve public schools. And again, I think we've demonstrated that we meet the thoroughness and effective standards. So I look forward to your decision. I hope it will be timely. Our kids absolutely deserve it. And I hope you all have a wonderful evening. Thank you so much. All right. Um, so now we can talk a, a little bit about how to proceed. Um, I will first maybe say, say a few things about what we had been talking about at the previous meeting. Um, we had started off with our current policy, which is just a statement of the obligation with no explanation about how to, what the committee would do in order to evaluate the thoroughness and effectiveness. I brought forward a proposal to hand it off to the superintendent to decide and make a recommendation. And um, you all didn't like that. So we found some, more possible way or more ways in which other districts can handle this. And that's where the DESI guidance, but it's just guidance. It's not, it has no force of law as far as I can uh, understand. Um, that's, and so we brought that forward too. I, I admit it was a mistake to present that information as a draft new policy, at least we could certainly change our policy if we want, 
but but Ms. Wallace, the petitioner, we have to evaluate her application under our existing policy. So that kind of brings us back to square one. I will also say that um, when I met with Dr. Z last week to talk about the agenda, I asked if she'd be willing to make um, Mary Kylie or Tanya McIntyre give us three hours of their time <laughs> to review the application re re or, or whatever else might be needed. Um, and she said yes, and Tanya's present. We all heard that Mary is leaving at the end of the month. Um, we wish her well, but my goodness, what a loss for uh, the district. Um, so that's, that's an option. It does take some time away from a, an administrator, but I don't think a very uh, large amount of time. Um, so that said, um, take comments, Jennifer. Can I jump in real quick before oh, Jennifer starts? Yes. Yeah, and, sure. and explain that the reason being is as teaching and learning works to develop the homeschool policy, it would help for them to understand the private school policy because we need to form, a, not, well, not policy, I'm sorry, because the, there's procedures, the guidelines that we are going to operate as as a district, it helps that team to, to kind of do it in alignment. So that's one of the reasons. And um, based on a time frame for November, Tanya will probably take the lead as Mary hands over all of those things to her. So you're saying it would be beneficial to the district because of your responsibility for evaluating homeschool applications to have Correct. these two separate jurisdictions, but essentially the same kind of evaluation have them harmonized. Correct. Yeah. Okay. All right, Jennifer. Um, I wanted to clarify a few things. So attorney Wallace said that we or the district has already approved, and as we've discussed, has already approved the homeschool curriculum, but um, we, the committee, have not done that. Um, my, it's, I, I'm learning as we go. It sounds like the district or the central office, the administration, is responsible for approving homeschool applications and curriculum, not the school committee. And, and now the school committee is responsible for approving the private school application. So it's two different bodies and two different parties who are doing this. It, it, it's, it's good information to feed our decision that the district has, all, or the administration, the central office has already approved the homeschool application, but that doesn't mean that we should just rubber stamp it. And, and it's, a, and, and we haven't seen, we haven't, we hadn't, we hadn't seen this before tonight. Um, I also want to clarify that um, you know, our job is, our responsibility is to um, approve uh, approve the curriculum a, a, as long as we're comfortable that students attending this school will receive whatever, a thorough and efficient um, education that the curriculum, it, it, you know, meets uh, the Amherst Public Schools, Amherst Elementary curriculum. Um, and, th and that to me doesn't, what that I mean, no matter how much I, um, how much I support the philosophy of the school or not, and in this case, I really do, that's not really relevant to what should go into our decision making. So we should, we should be, we should be focusing on what our job is, which is to approve the curriculum. All that being said, I, I don't, you know, I don't see any red flags. I don't see any reason at this point not to approve the school, not that we're going to do it tonight, but I, I would be, you know, in, in, um, I don't see any reason not to approve it at, at this point, and but I would appreciate hearing from Tanya about her um, opinions and perspective on the curriculum, so that we can vote comfortably at at our next opportunity. Thank you, Deb. Yeah, um, I would like somebody, and I'm perfectly happy for it to be um, somebody in the superintendent's office to take a closer look at um, the assessment procedures and the um, alignment with standards and maybe some sample lessons. I, I don't have any problem um, moving forward once that's done and, and based on their timeline, I don't see the need to wait until November when they're ready to kind of give us feedback. I'm willing to have a special meeting if the timeliness is important for the school's functioning. Dr. Z? I just want to be clear on two things. One, um, policy IHBG is instruction and home, home education of students. 
That is the policy that states that the superintendent has the right to approve or reject the home education plan. Um, and then if there is an issue with the rejection of the home education plan, it is then escalated to the school committee. Second of all, I just want to be very clear is that Sarah Marshall did propose to have the superintendent or designee review this and have this done after the presentation is done to the committee. And that was a part of her original submittal in terms of the updating of the policy. As I see fit right now, I would give my stamp of approval on the 80 acres um, homeschool program once I get the information that shows where it moves forward. I, like I stated, I think that the instructional materials have a different approach. Um, I think that the only thing I'm not clear on is how many students per grade level they plan to have. I do not know if that's within our purview or not. Um, I do know that my team is prepared to support it so that it can align with what we're doing in terms of the homeschool procedures, because technically, even her presentation this evening of the fact that this district in the past has already approved the homeschool curriculum and plan, whether individually or not, shows that there was some sort of support that the previous administration who sat in these seats felt needed to be given to the programming at, at large based on the parents' individual submittals. And so based on their individual submittals, there was already an approval. That is because curricular materials and curricular decisions falls under the auspice of the superintendent's office. And as such, that's where, that's where the home school and home education of students lies. I do think that, that in essence, there are two things that need to occur here. One, there needs to be a consistency when it comes to policies and updating and procedures. And we need, really need to take a deep dive um, around what's happening with policies, what needs to be updated, what are the gaps, and what are the procedures that need to be in place. And for my office, in terms of being the superintendent, we are looking at what are the guidelines and things that we need to address in terms of how do we implement the policies that are in place, definitely. Um, but Deb, I do think that making them wait an extended period of time for us to decide whether or not um, it moves forward doesn't make much sense when evidence shows that grade levels were already approved by this district in the past, whether it was of the knowledge of the committee or not, it is within the purview as established through the policy that the superintendent was supposed to approve and reject. So that's why I asked for, for the grade levels um, that were previously approved. And then the fact that there are some procedural things that need to be added on. And those procedural things in terms of notice of intent to continue to homeschool needs to be put in place from the superintendent's office. That needs to be in there, but that has nothing to do with her application as is. I also want to be clear that the intent is to provide the students with relevant experiences that align with the curriculum. What I heard her say was that as running a homeschool program that they currently run does not allow them to apply for funding for or different opportunities for students to um, explore the experiential portions of it. And I think that's the part that we need to look at. So for, for me, I'm like, I just, I would say, stamp approval. Um, the team can take a deeper dive. They're fine because it helps them to go through those things. Um, Sarah Marshall did say once we had this meeting, she would need about three hours of their time to dig deeper. They're, they're on board. Um, but I also do agree that one of the key things we need to hear of, whether or not um, it is this committee, past practice has been timely. And she clearly stated that. And if past practice has been timely, then we do not want to show the face that because it is now 80 acres, we are not timely. So I don't know who whoever needs to reach out to to determine in 2020 what was done, but I think fair is fair. And if the standard of practice was two months, three months, a month, then it needs to be extended to this, this organization as well. Thank you. Bridget, you're muted. Okay, thank you. So um, I think we've been talking about curriculum and that's because, um, you know, the piece of the application that was really stressed to us was about the thoroughness and uh, efficientness of the curriculum, right? But when you look at the criteria for accepting it, and when I looked at the application in Northampton, there were other things outside of the curriculum that are important for us to consider in the approval. So there was like health, safety, 
someone like transportation TSO, we call it an Amherst planning board, like they make sure the site is good and good for traffic with children and that type of piece. Um, you know, obviously the fire and inspections, now that it's not a homeschool thing where they're in the privacy of their own home, it's a school, there's certain additional criteria that are required. And then, um, you know, some things that the standard even suggests are site visit, visits. Um, what's our plan for like renewal? How long are we approving it for before we periodically review those types of things? I you know, me personally, I support this particular project, um, you know, very much so, but I want to make sure that we're also doing what we're required to do so that um, in every case that we're being consistent. All right, I I'll say a couple things um, in response. Policy, our current policy, LBC, if I'm remembering the letters right, States our obligation. And the only thing it talks about is curriculum. It says nothing about health and safety. I mean, planning board, <laughs> fire, any of that, all those other things um, come to our, or at least came to my attention through that DESI guidance. But it's not a regulation. It has no force of law. The only law is the one that's reflected in our in our current policy, and that's to evaluate curriculum. So we could decide to make this a super extensive investigation, but the more I've thought about it, the more unnecessary I find that, because there are many um, town departments that have responsibility for for a, a lot of these things. Um, there's there's the building inspector, there's zoning board of appeals. There's, you know, there's a lot of branches of town government that specialize in those things. That is not what we specialize in. You know, we're we're in delivery of curriculum and, and student learning. So in this this is not a, a 200 200 student school, you know, if it were the, on that scale, then I might be more interested in making sure with so many students and so many moving parts, they had more sort of administrative systems in place. But I feel that that is really overkill in this situation. Deb. You are muted. Thank you. Um, you had said that um, there was a there was an email or communication from Attorney Terry around our responsibilities around this. Sarah. It was just a conversation. There's no there's no document. Can he send an email to the committee so that we could also receive that information directly? I will. I will ask him. I mean, you need him to to say that our policy is binding. What what is it that you need to hear from him? The way I heard you say it was that our responsibility is to execute our policy as it stands now, and I'd just like to hear that from him directly. I mean that we can't change the policy during a when a petition is underway? No, meaning that our responsibility is to execute our current policy. Okay, I, I, okay, I will ask him. I, which I mean, is I, I, different what, from where we were going the last time we spoke, which is, you know. Right. Well, if we had a different policy, then we would execute that, but. I was mostly, last meeting, I was mostly leaning on the guidance from Desi which is not in our policy. It wasn't looking at your draft. It wasn't looking at Wellesley's draft. It wasn't anything more than looking at what Desi said our responsibilities to the public are. And obviously that is not relevant based on the guidance that you said that 
attorney Terry provided for us. And I just like to put those two pieces together myself. I would suggest maybe, well, maybe we should all reread that DESI guidance because what I recall it saying is that here are things that school committees might consider. I understand well, that. It wasn't to do this. But I, I no, I, I, I said it was guidance. I meant it was guidance. You okay. said that he said that our responsibility is to execute our policy as it stands. And I would like to bring the DESI guidance together with the guidance from our attorney, myself, if I may. Thank you. I'm just writing. So Bridget, go ahead. <laughs> Thanks. I think, um, yes, those other de town departments are, are required and it could be as simple as making a motion. Obviously we're not there, but maybe at the next meeting and thinking what the components of that motion might be um, to get enough consensus or votes on the committee for like, we give our approval, you know, um, following, you know, we, this is a yes vote that will go into effect as soon as fire and traffic safety and, um, you know, demonstration of policy for referring kids under, you know, to special ed or whatever those particular components might be. And then we could make a yay vote. And if we receive those, then we go ahead and it's all a go. But I feel like we have one liability if we approve, uh, you know, a place that's set up to go up in flames, not saying that's the case here at all. But secondly, we also have an obligation for any students who might return in middle school or whatnot when the school doesn't continue past fourth grade, that they've been received actually the thoroughness of education that we want or that they need to have to be able to develop well in the later grades. So those are just things on my mind. Earth. I think that we really need to make some distinctions here between what the regulations are, what the laws are, and what the guidance are. Uh, because, you know, those are three things, and those are three different things. And we, uh, when we were making our determination, have to fit within them. Uh, and and so if you're asking Mark, Mark's going to say, "Here's the law," uh, and 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 that law is, is uh, part and parcel of what may be a part of a regulation or a part, part part of a regulation. Desi guidance is not necessarily guidance that is uh, regulation or laws. It's it's just that it's guidance. So. What we must be careful of is that we operate a within our policy because that is something we have as a concrete starting point. All right, we can't and should not go out and and introduce or create new policy, uh, uh, and then have this school uh, have to uh, have to have have to deal with it because that would not be fair. What we must do is make sure that whatever decision we make falls within the regulations of the state, i.e. DESI, all right? That, and that, 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 that it has to fall in that line. And, and that, when we came up with our policy, it has a, it has a uh, reference, a legal reference there. Uh, so we need to just make sure that. Uh, and we also definitely should not be creating unnecessary obstacles in in, in, uh, in this uh, this application. Let's, in other words, do not use this application uh, as a way of uh, having us then go and produce a new regulation or new uh, or, or 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 new um, policy that they then must uh, um, operate under. Uh, let's go under what we know is possible now and then apply that, not nothing new. And I would say our policy does not mention DESI guidance. It doesn't, all it does 
to say that we have to, <laughs> if we're, we approve it if we're satisfied that the curriculum equals the public schools in thoroughness and efficiency, end of story. Exactly. Uh, end of our policy. And I'm afraid that if we introduce a lot of other requirements, um, we, I think we might face a legal challenge for you know, how come we're applying, you know, doing more than the policy says? So, I mean, I will ask, I will ask Mark. <laughs> right. I, mean, I don't want this to be, I don't want this to be a situation in which this application gives us the opportunity to apply uh, and produce a new policy. That is, that's not what this is all about. If we want to change our policy afterwards, I think. Yes, we can do that, but do not do it uh, prospectively. Dr. Z. I would advise this committee to please move forward with established policy as, as is, review and determine after this process that there are things that need to improve, then move forward with updating of your policy moving forward. You would put yourself in a legal ramification, like in legal issues, with the fact that you are now choosing this organization to change your policy midstream. That's one. Two, if we are not going to vote on this this evening and there's still additional information that the committee feels like they need, I feel like you should give uh, Ms. Wallace, give a Ms. Wallace enough time to provide that information within the realm that this committee is justifiably supposed to ask for as outlined in your policy or in the rules and regs. I think that that is the critical next step. Then if you're going to review the materials with the team, I think at least sometime this week or next week to review the materials. I do think that if you have the opportunity to review and recap what has been past practice in terms of an adequate timeline, you need to do such. And I'm going to ask, because we're buttoned up on a nine o'clock um, hour, and I'm struggling here because I really would like to go take some some kind of sinus medication, okay. that, that the committee makes a, um, a decision in terms of how you are, are going to justifiably, legally, and clearly, transparently move forward in this process to determine if you are going to approve or not and be prepared to strongly justify any decision that you have or or will will or will not make anything that you accept or reject you are the final approving body just know that that's my last spiel in this all right we do need to wrap this up so deb and then i'm going to make a proposal you're unmuted I was going to make a proposal. I was going. I would like to move that we approve the eighty acres private school application for um, K through four. 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 Let me just say that if we vote on this and we do not have three votes, that is their application is defeated. So um, I want us to think, <laughs> think hard about pursuing that motion at this time. Uh, Maybe people can indicate in for like where, what y'all take the temperature? Like Jennifer, where are you at? No, I mean, wait, 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 my, my thought is, is to put a little bit differently. Do you do we believe we have enough information based on our policy to make a decision this evening? Well, there's been there's Deb. I would ask you if you could withdraw it at this time. I withdraw my motion. Thank you so much because I would like to suggest that we ask. Tanya McIntyre, thank you very much, to review the material that Ms. Wallace has submitted, to uh, reach out to her, copying me, if you want to get lesson plans, um, you know, anything, any more information 
you would need Tanya to um, make an evaluation and and tell me like I, I'm happy to call a special meeting just to just to vote on this if, if that's the only issue it probably wouldn't take very long so Tanya do you think like what's your what could, when can you imagine coming back to us at the recommendation of the superintendent as you direct her I can open my calendar for Friday if that's available to you all um, and if that's too soon, Tuesday or Wednesday would work. I'm sorry. Oh, if, come back to us. Like you would have, you would have a recommendation for us. I will review the materials and um, be prepared to recommend something to you on Friday. This Friday. Um, if you can get me all the materials, I'll I'll go through it. All right. Well, the the application is attached to board docs. You should look at that and, and then you will know whether you want to get additional information. If um, there's supplemental uh, information that was um, shared, please share that. But um, I'll go through everything and, and um, be ready to present something to you on Friday. Um, that's very ambitious. <laughs> that's wonderful to hear. Um, that might actually be I would have to I would have to post it tomorrow, and then if there were any delay, it might be better just to 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 do it next week. That doesn't mean it needs to take a week of your time, but it would okay. allow allow for a little, yeah, maybe getting more information from Ms. Wallace, Jennifer. My suggestion to the chair is that I don't think this requires a special meeting. We have enough meetings, and you've already informed Ms. Wallace that we wouldn't be voting tonight. So I think our next meeting, which is only a month after we've originally first seen this application, is sufficient. And I think that gives Tanya and, and Attorney Wallace time to, to go back and forth if there needs to be. And then at the November meeting, we'll have all the information that we need. And I would imagine it's going to be a pretty quick vote to vote <laughs> to approve this. Like, I, I wouldn't want to vote tonight, but like, once I get Tanya's okay, which I'm sure we'll get, uh, I think on in the, at the November meeting, it'll be pretty quick. And if we could move on, that would be great. Yes. Well, I need to know from, if there are any committee members who are just, who will not be comfortable, um, uh, will not be comfortable voting based only on the curricular materials, basically that we've gotten already. So, if it's okay, Sarah, I just wanted to say when the superintendent was speaking, I put my hand up before that, I'm because sorry. while you are were talking, I went through and read the end of DESE and then went back to our policy. And um, it seems like that for that, well, we do want to update our policy to include those other things. And I think they would be ideal to have in place to hold this school to that requirement wouldn't be proper. Yeah, I okay. agree with that Thank thinking. You. Yeah. All right. All right, so I will confer with Tanya, make sure she has what we have, figure out if she needs to uh, reach out to Ms. Wallace and, and we'll just take it from there. Irv, anything more I wanna yeah, close? Just, just to be clear that when Tanya comes back to us, the school committee, we then look at what she says in light of our current policy. Yes, yes. That's it, nothing more, nothing else. All right, thank you so much. Can we take uh, like a two minute break? Uh, people go get water, maybe <laughs> Dr. Z can get her, get her medication or whatever. All right, two minutes, five minutes, it'll just, okay, five minutes. Two, two minutes, uh, I'm in the office. I am nowhere near home, two. Uh, oh, all right, go make it three. Turn off your camera, turn off your mic if you want privacy, but stay in earshot, thank you.
folks, when you're back, please turn on your camera so I know. Tanya, will you, you're in school, right? Yeah. Yes, I am. I'm, in, I'm still at the office. Okay, so you all, the middle school has heat. Do you know what the situation is at the high school? Are they going to have? I'm not sure. Oh, dear. <laughs> all right. Hi, Sarah Marshall. Parts of the school does. Um, we have an issue with the boiler. We brought in the, um, we're waiting to confirm that the individual will be there. So they're supposed to start, they were originally were supposed to start Thursday. We asked them to bump it up. They're supposed to start tomorrow afternoon. Um, my understanding is this is a longstanding issue. There are multiple boilers, but one boiler actually is completely down. And so that's affecting classrooms on the second, third, and parts of the first floor. And so that's that's really what we're addressing. We did send out a notification. Principal Sadiq Talib, he did send out a notification to, to parents um, to Parent Square and email, and we posted it on our social media platform as well. And then um, he sent out an email to staff. So our, we're tracking it. We're going to make sure, and we promised um, parents to please keep them <laughs> But I do want us to hit Mary. How are you, hon? Um, hit our next section, which is on the MCAS data. Yeah. Well, I mean, let me just excuse me. I need to confirm that every that we have. Oh, a sorry. So oh, I see Jennifer, Irv, Bridget, Deb. Are you there? You certainly have a. Thank you. Okay, please proceed. So um, the next section that we're going in under new business is um, we're going to be presenting. The team is going to be presenting the MCAS data. Um, and district designations for the Amherst um, public schools. Um, just so the community is aware, Amherst is the elementary district. Um, there is an early childhood center, early education center, um, and three elementary schools, Crocker Farm, Fort River, and Wildwood. Um, this evening, we are gonna be presenting the team, Tanya and Mary Kyler are gonna be going through um, the MCAS data that's that was just released um, and the district designation. And so I hand it over to the two dynamic ladies who are, <laughs> you know, who are pushing teaching and learning um, to present this this evening. Thank you, Dr. Z. So Tanya and I are going to do this on speed dial because it's already been a long meeting. I know there are other agenda items to cover. Um, we did um, go over the accountability guidelines last week for the region. So we're hoping that um, the committee members um, will remember that. We'll, we'll go over it very briefly. And for those of our viewers who are at home, all of this is available on the board doc notes. Um, so in the interest of time, we are going to give an abbreviated um, presentation right now. So Tanya, would you like to skip ahead maybe to around slide 12 and I'll sort of fill in as we go? Okay, so here's our accountability report for Amherst. And as we mentioned last week with the region, the accountability report is something that DESE produces every fall with two goals, really. The first is to provide clear and actionable info mm -hmm. for families and community members about how schools and districts are doing. And the other purpose is for it to serve as a resource allocation tool for DESE. So, Here's the accountability report for Amherst and um, districts don't get um, a norm referenced accountability percentile. They get a criterion referenced target percentage. So what that means is districts get judged against themselves. Um, Desi looks at where the district has been in terms of five different indicators sets what they think is a reasonable goal for each of those indicators, and then measures their progress against those five um, indicators. So for us, for this year, if you go look down at the very bottom, we actually went from 36% last year to 81% this year. So it was a substantial gain. The reason why we have the 63% um, is they do a two-year weighted average. So there was substantial progress on several of the indicators, which we're going to look at in a second. 
So here's the breakdown. There are five indicators, as you can see on the left. They look at achievement and growth. Those are both related to pro student performance on MCAS. Um, they look at high school completion, which obviously is not relevant for the elementary district. They look at progress toward attaining English language proficiency. That's measured through the access testing. And then they look at um, additional indicators, which advanced coursework doesn't apply for an elementary district. So it's basically chronic absenteeism. So you can see in the achievement and growth sections, um, we, we had quite high ratings. Desi thought that we were making significant progress. And Tanya is gonna go dig into that a little bit when she goes over MCAS scores. Um, and then also on the um, chronic absenteeism, last year we actually had a zero out of four. So there's progress on that as well. This was just 2023. Some of my comments were based on that. So you can move and people can look at that online. This is a chart that we showed last week for the region as well, just so that um, viewers and the committee could see how we're doing with our participation rates in the MCAS and access testing. Desi um, is very strict about this. They want a 95% participation rate. It's actually required by the federal government as well. And you can see that we've fallen down on this. Um, over on the right-hand side with the box in green, that's the state participation rates um, for students in various groups. And then the blue is ours. So um, we're not achieving that 95% always. Now this is, um, this just shows us for the three schools, um, the, the individual schools do get they get criterion referenced um, measures. So they do look at their own indicators and their progress on those indicators, but they also get a norm referenced piece, which means what they do is they just rank the schools from lowest to highest across the state. Just like with MCAS, that being, you know, where students get compared to all other students rather than just to themselves. For these, for these indicators on the bottom, all the schools across the state are being compared to each other. So you can see um, Crocker Farm is almost in the top quarter of all the schools in the state on, on this particular ranking. Um, Fort River and Wildwood are both above the midpoint. And this we talked about last week as well with meeting or exceeding expectations. That's what we look at with MCAS scores. And on this chart, you can see that for 2024, Amherst was above the state in all areas. This is for all students collectively. Um, in all, all MCAS tests at all grades, except for grade four math, where we were slightly below the state average. Now we're gonna look briefly at the breakdowns by school. So the schools, as I said, they get that, um, they get the accountability percentile, which the district doesn't get. That's where Crocker got that 71%. And then down at the bottom, they get they also get measured um, against those five indicators. So Crocker had a substantial jump up this year from 44% last year to 80% this year. With an, and then their overall weighted average was 66. So um, here you can see there's um, there's some progress on both on achievement and growth with MCAS and, and also um, the English language proficiency, that was substantially lower. That was zero over four last year, two over four this year. This is Fort River. Fort River um, went from 38% last year to 79% this year. So also some very strong growth in terms of um, and this is the criterion reference piece, right? So that's their, they're being measured against their own improvement targets on this part. And you can see here, um, Tanya will, will point you this, um, also with the MCAS, the first two, the achievement and growth, um, they're getting four out of four this year, um, not just for the students at large, but also for the lowest performing students. Um, 
this is these charts are interesting because they don't for 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 example for Crocker to get four out of four and for Fort River to get four out of four does not mean they scored their students scored at the same level right it means that the targets that the state set for them were achieved and you'll see when we get to the MCAS breakdowns that in fact there are differences among the schools in terms of, of how their students are doing on MCAS. But this is still very encouraging because this means that, that we're making very good progress in terms of, of our individual improvement targets. And this is Wildwood. So Wildwood went from 46% to 67%. And again, with the accountability percentile above the uh, midpoint. And here, there's a um, Wildwood did did you can see um, had some strong four out of fours with with the achievement um, and strong on the growth with the MCAS um, did did not get scored as highly with the lowest performing students. So that would be a difference from the other two schools. Uh, thank you, Mary. So just to remind you, we're going to be looking at exceeding expectations and meeting expectations. That is that M plus E category when you take a look at um, the results. And again, we're going to do a speed round for uh, for this information just to make sure that you see an overall uh, delineation of what's happening. So here's the breakdown of uh, schools and also our Amherst Public School District. Even though it says Amherst Pelham, these are just the Amherst schools that uh, we're looking at the ratings of. Uh, last year, we were at 50%. This year, we're at 52%. I put in slides for each of the schools and ELA. That was the first. Now we're looking at math. Again, raising from 43% to 49%. And then we're looking at science, a big jump from 41% to 57%. When we look at what's happening overall with our El Amherst Elementary Schools, I gave you also the breakdown like I did last week for the high school and middle school. You have um, by race, by high needs, IEPs, EL, low income. You're able to dig into that data and see it. And I included the charts to give you a, a clearer picture of what's happening. As we look here on ELA, M plus E, meeting plus exceeding. Um, our white students are at 65%. Um, our multi-ethnic students are at 58%. And then there is still a gap here uh, with our uh, Hispanic, Asian, and Black families, um, with our Hispanic families being, our students being at 20%. If you look similarly on math, we still have that large gap. Here, um, our Asian students are closing the gap from 67 to 63, but there is still a wide gap with 24 and 26 for our uh, black and brown students. And again, you'll see to the right, we're looking at high needs, the gaps between our high needs students and our students with IEPs, our EL students, as well as our low income students. As we look at science, um, kids are really doing well. Our white kids are really doing well. The 74% meeting and exceeding. Again, um, our gap is there. And if you notice the big gap there with Black and Hispanic students, where Black kids uh, were at 17%. Just like last time, I gave you the full DESE accountability uh, slide where you can click on it and go to school profiles. But there's also just the Amherst profile, as long as well as the district. Um, beyond that, oops, let's go that way. When you take a look, I also broke it down by each school for each that um, each uh, subtest that was taken. So you'll notice that I gave you a slide for Crocker Farm, for Crocker Farm ELA, Crocker Farm Math, Crocker Farm Science, Fort River, and if if you want, we can take a look. I just wanted you to know that we have it for every school. As you look at ELA with our um, Fort River School, again, same setup in terms of how you look at the data. Our white students at 60% for uh, meeting and exceeding. Our Hispanic students are at 
here, notice that the gap is larger between our uh, white students and Hispanic students than it is for our black students and our Asian students. Here it's where, and I'm pointing, stopping here because this is the one place where if you notice the gap is smaller for our black students than it was in, in any other um, school or subtest. But here the gap is so large for our Hispanic students, 10% to 60%. Again, math, here it goes back. We're looking again, uh, our Asian students are outperforming their white counterparts at 71%. Again, Hispanic and black students are um, behind with 18 and 20%. Uh, I want you to note that here in Fort River Science, you'll notice there is not a percentage for our Native American or our Black students, and that's because it's a smaller cohort of students, so they don't give a percentage, so you can't identify students that way. Um, but you'll see, again, the gap between our white students and our Hispanic students, 71 to 29 percent. And I just um, want to jump in here real quick. I know we're yeah. speeding through it. Um, but I wanna highlight the fact that at Fort River, and I know that this is why we have to have the deeper conversation around what's happening with instruction as, as a whole in that entire building, because the gap between the Hispanic students and, and, and other demographics exceedingly hits over 60%. In each one of the each one of the sub core subject areas. So even though it houses our bilingual program, it, it is one that we're seeing that something is not happening where the instruction correlates with how the students are performing. And again, the growth is based on how they align with themselves. So they are not even being being um matched against another another school. This is just within the Fort River building itself. So again, this is why we're diving into the, the there, and I know we're going through it, but I think with everything that we're talking about, we have to give a full picture of what's happening. Sorry, Tanya, speed through the rest. Oh, no problem. Um, and again, we have the same breakdowns for Wildwood. Um, again, we're looking at our ELA, math and science. I, again, I put in the different uh, charts for you so you could be able to see it visually of what's happening, but you also have um, the percentages. Here in ELA, 74% for our white students, 73% for our Asian students, and then noticing that our Hispanic students and Black students, um, they're at 18 and 37%. Uh, you have the same information for math. I want you to notice here 56% uh, for our uh, white students. Our Asian students are outperforming their counterparts with 88%, but our Hispanic students are at 5% and our Black students are at 13%. And then finally with science, again, notice that the, the gap is between our Hispanic and Black students as compared to their Asian and white counterparts. Um, I have uh, several other slides in here for you so that you can see the breakdown for participation rates like we did um, last week with the high school and middle school. You'll see it for all three elementary schools for each grade level and for each subtest. So I'll turn it back over uh, to the superintendent. So I do wanna say thank you, Tanya. Thank you, Mary. Um, I know we have might have a few questions, um, but I really wanna highlight the fact that again, what we're seeing is that instructional model and, and materials that are currently in place even though our, there are students and supports that are there, we're going to delve deeper to see if what we have supports all. And then we have to, to spiral back and determine what are we missing in terms of instructional gaps. Um, what you see is though, like if we look at Crocker Farm, there seems to be a balance in terms of what's happening with some of the subgroups. However, there's still a gap between our Black and Hispanic students and our Asian and our white students in certain subject areas. What we are also seeing that are positives though, is that our black students are performing in mathematics. They just need to determine, we, we now need to delve deeper and determine what are those specific domains that we need to shift and change. So when we look at data right now, we're presenting our overarching picture, but we need to dive deeper into what are the domains? What are the areas? Is it geometry? Is it specifically, um, like I said before, we have issues with writing. 
uh, when we look at reading, is it informational text versus literature? How do we shift our instructional model and what's taught when so that students are clearly exposed and starting to master those skills? Another concern at the elementary level is how we, how we present progress to parents. Because our current reporting model, one is standards-based and two only happens twice a year, we don't adequately allow, we don't adequately inform parents around student progress for them to support them at a timely, at timely, we, timely. So we are sharing things like our I ready reports and different and different aspects. But again, there are some guidelines and procedural things as a district that we need to put into place. And we'll present, I'll present those findings in my report of entry. Um, so that you can kindly see what are some things that we now need to, to, to put forth. Um, but we do need to delve into our critical subgroups. Um, overarchingly, we seem to be growing, we seem to be doing well, but when we delve into our subgroup, instruction does not is not equitable across our subgroups. And when we look at our schools, especially when we delve into, for example, Fort River, where we should see an increase in terms of our Hispanic and Latin populations, where they should be outperforming or doing well because of our bilingual program, we actually are showing where they're not meeting or exceeding standards. And so that's, that's again, where we need to talk about what are the pros, what are the cons, and how do we sustain these and delve deeper into what are the domains, what are the gaps that we're seeing, what's happening. Um, and so we we are working in terms of building out our data dashboard. I have to say thank you to the ladies because the, sh the screenshots of the MCAS data actually came from our initial dashboard that was given to us. So you get to see what we are going to delve, I know what we're going to delve into. When the full dashboard is, is given, we will actually be able to highlight students by programs. We'll be able to highlight students you know, to be able to say adequately against subgroups, what are they doing, and even down to teacher and classrooms. So we really want to delve deeper and create an, an atmosphere of data. Um, and I'll stop talking and open up for a few questions and hope that this committee acts for us to amend our agenda, but go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> wow, to that last point, hold on, hold on. I, will, I want to end this meeting at 9.30. It's been a long night. And thank you, Mary and Tanya for, for and everybody for hanging in here. Um, and I do want to give Dr. Z time to talk about the budget, you know, whatever she has to tell us about the budget. So I don't want a lot of questions now. I see two hands, two questions, and then we're moving on. I'm sure we're going to be coming back to this, these data because it's going to come through eventually in the budget and in the school implementation plans and in curricular changes. So I, I think we can make time for, for more discussion, but just a, two quick questions and then we'll move on. Deb. And Sarah, if you need be, if, if the committee members who do, don't have their hand raised now, if they can email you the questions yes. and then you can email it to us, we can send our responses back and even post it on board docs. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so I'll collect, collect the questions. So, good idea. Deb? Are um, math and ELA interventions at Fort River available in um, Spanish and English? Um, give me one second. I'm going to do something really, really quick. And I know um, it is supposed to be, but I want to show you real quick. Next question while I pull this up. Go ahead. Herb, what's your question? Two questions. One, well, one's a question. Uh, is this presentation available on board docs for us? It is. Second is an observation that the uh, differences, the inequalities persist across all grades from Correct. elementary grade, school through middle school and high school. Uh, for those uh, who are African-American, or Hispanic. It's an incredible uh, kind of wake-up call for this school district because our students, low-income, minority, Hispanic, Black, are just not getting what they should be getting. They're not achieving at the levels that they should be achieving at. And I hope 
that this community looks at this and says, hey, this is not, not only okay. To me, when I look at it, and, 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 and now that I've seen it all through all, all of the grades, including in high school, middle school and high school, this, this is not something that I, I can see as, as something that's just a matter of passing curiosity. This is a crisis. And this community needs to realize it is a crisis for our minority students. And I we need to do it. I agree, Irv. Um, I I want to I'm going to jump back to your thing, and then Deb, this is Fort Rivers' schedule. Um, this is what Tammy has been running for the past couple of years. What you're going to see is this is the Explorers program, Mary. If I'm, and then you have Caminantes in in two groups, so you have Azul and you have Rojo, the blue group and the red group, ninety ten. And as you can see, this is a part of what happens, and this is how they have literally tried to make sense of running the pro yeah, Deb. I, I see how you're holding your head. So this is why I said when we <laughs> correct. And so this is this is what um they have had to try and and make happen. So when you ask about interventions in Caminantes and stuff, you can see that. It happens within tier one or within tier one instruction. Um, but again, this is running a staff and trying to run a schedule. And as you can see, there's one, two, three, four, like, like yeah. So one, two, three, and four. About yeah, lunch period. So this is coming on to this is coming on to and explorers in Fort River. This is what they try to operate within. And this is what I've been saying when I say that it actually operates in, in, in a way that's not conducive for the school building. So when you ask about what's available, um, they do try to build in the content and the instruction in terms of interventions, and it rotates throughout, throughout the school. So I'll stop sharing that, and then we'll set up for them to come and do a presentation for you. I agree. It's a, it's a, it is a crisis. It's um, it's very disturbing. Um, it is. But we need to know where we are, <laughs> where we are, in order to do better and and be able to measure that progress. So I, I'm glad to see data. This is the first time I've seen the data. So thank you again for that. Let's move on. Um, I'm and, ready. And get a budget update. <laughs> All right. So we're going to zoom through this um, as much as possible. Thank you, Shannon, for bearing with us. And so Shannon's going to jump in and assist me. Um, we combine our quarter one update with our um, preliminary budget data. Can everybody see the screen? Yes. All right, so in terms of our quarter one update, um, throughout the first quarter, FY25, Amherst Elementary School, is proceeding as expected. Um, there are a couple things that facilities and district-wide support, which includes foster and home clear tra transportation is, homeless transportation is trending high. And we are expecting it will need some adjustment or as we move throughout the fiscal year. So we are monitoring that. Um, they, we have encumbered thus far um, and the amount of funding we've encumbered thus far, that's our major concern um, and not so much the actual spending to date. We also know that salaried payroll is, is tracking kind of low, but what we are seeing and what our concerns are going to be moving forward is the fact that, um, and I'm going to say this, we are experiencing a audit of our salaries and we're seeing that there are certain things that we, in terms of payroll, and we are seeing certain things that we are addressing. Um, so we do have some payroll concerns. However, because we are um, preparing for FY26, we do have some concerns as well, as well around where and bringing on new staff. Um, and we'll present that when we move forward. We also, 
I would also say that read through the update that's in there um, that I attached to board docs right now so we could talk about that. Um, special education is trending above expectations in some part due to the encumbrances for staff positions that have not yet been filled um, and as well as services because of our staffing attendance as well. We've had to procure a lot of services um, also, the Amherst School District, the elementary district, does have a lot of out-of-district placements, I believe. And so right now, what we're looking at is, or we have individuals who have come into the district, um, rightfully so, and they are in need of um, supports and services, especially when it comes to staffing that we have had to budget for, and that is coming from our special education. Um, facilities is also trending on the high side. And we need to look to refine or reduce our encumbrances based on actual spending. As you know, we spent for Crocker Farm with the fire um, alert system update. There are some other things facilities wise. And one of the things I'm going to tell you is that the impact of deferred maintenance is coming to an head. And so things that we did not budget for because we thought we didn't think about um, deferred maintenance is coming forth and we are definitely tracking higher when it comes in Amherst. So we are definitely looking to see where else in the budget we can support facilities because without adequate facilities, there is no environment for teaching and learning. Um, so there are, I just would like you to know, I'm probably going to institute a budgetary freeze um, um, to make sure that we can adequately uh, afford to make it through quarter two, three and into four without ending the year wondering how we're going to pay for certain um, things. So the preliminary FY26 budget, there are some assumptions that are in place. Um, one, we took into account that this is a um, contract negotiation year with our largest bargaining unit, APEA. So we're looking at what are some possible steps and COLA that we can go up to. We are trying to determine what is the adequate percentage that we can go up to for our staffing, um, we also look. We also applied about seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars of school choice in the line. I did present in the update our school choice numbers and say what we projected versus what we filled. Um, we did apply our circuit breaker to special education around three hundred and eighty-two thousand um, dollars. We looked at the support from UMass at one hundred and eighty-five thousand. And that was applied within the payroll lines. There are some positions that were in there. I am going to express that I do have a deep concern in applying. I know that was past practice, but I have a deep concern of applying um, gifts to actual salaries. Um, and so the team and I are working at what that's going to look like um, and kind of flipping that and taking that out of personnel costs and into operational costs so that personnel is not impacted as was recently happened in another portion of another district that I run. Um, and then estimated 13%, as you know, um, from the regional side, we were asked to estimate our health insurance at 13% increase this year. That's a, that's a serious increase. Um, not just our health insurance, our actual liability insurances went up this year drastically, including our employee liability insurance, we are considered high risk districts. Um, and so Amherst is in there in terms of our employee liability insurance and that went up um, this year as well. Um, we're budgeting out because we have to go out and bid our transportation, a suggested transportation increase of about 10%. Um, and so one of the things we're gonna look at too, we haven't run all of our cost savings scenarios um, but we are running, we are going to run through our scenarios a couple of this right now, but we haven't been able to do the cost savings. This is a preliminary conversation. And then we're assuming that the town is going to give us 2.5% increase from last year. Um, and then we also took into account that we do not have ESSER funds. And so there are things, for example, there's $500,000 that we budgeted in 20. Five um, that we don't have to account for in 26. So we are about to, I am about to show you what the reality is for the upcoming year. Um, right now, 
this year our projected um our projected deficit with the 2.5% and all of the um projections all of the assumptions that we I just ran through in place we would have a deficit of 1.4 million dollars in the Amherst district um again things that I want you to to look at there is an increase in central office this is not in terms of personnel this is an increase in terms of operational costs one we are looking at our legal costs um, we do have an increased numbers of personnel cases and matters. Two, we're trying to account for the Amherst portion of the increase in the employee liability and our general insurances. And so between insurance and legal costs, um, that is where this increase to the central office lies because that's where the overarching budget lines come from. We are also looking in terms of transportation. Again, knowing that we're going out to bid this year for a new transportation contract, we need to increase about 10%. And we're looking at our projected routes that we had this year in terms of um, funding out, in terms of our students who need support, not just in terms of our general education, but our special education service, transportation services. Additionally, if you look at our risk and benefits, this is the largest increase for FY26 at 762,000 approximately. This increase is this large because one, again, we're accounting for the 13% health insurance increase, as well as the fact that our risk and like, like, like there are other things that we have to put in there, but this is solely our health insurance increase with a smidgen, a smidgen accounted for in terms of our other insurances that we pay. But largely, this is our 13% health insurance increase. And so again, with the town budget target, um, the increase needed for 676,000, um, after we reduce out our circuit breaker and different things with special education, we will still have a projected reduction or deficit of 1.4 million. So as we did with the region, we wanna to present tonight to Amherst, what are some possible scenarios um, we have three scenarios that we have brought forth to the school committee in terms of budgeting. Um, one, if we have the standard 2.5%, um, we would be at that deficit of 1.4 million, which was presented. The Again, the scenario two, at 3%, we would be at a deficit of 1.2 million. Again, key things to think about. Because we had in the FY, again, realistically, we budgeted into FY25's base, the 500,000 from ESSER, that was accounted for in terms of things that, to operationally or even personnel to function. Now that is not there, and we increase our insurance with 700,000, you are seeing the impact again of not having a clear, realistic budget that did not include a dependence on federal funds, um, that 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 brings us forward into this and then scenario three asking or having a four percent we would have a flat about one million dollars we have not run savings in possible saving scenarios as yet um at all we would need to run that through to determine on the elementary level that is one reason one where we're looking at um this year, in terms of us closing out quarter one, we're in a good place, but we are seeing, again, like I talked about, facilities is trending higher, um, special education is pushing up higher, and we're looking at what personnel that we do definitely need to bring in because we don't want to bring individuals in for us to then have to release them due to the fact that we have seniority clauses and other clauses in place. And so... That is where we are at in terms of our FY26. This is still early in terms of projections. Um, we have started, we, we do have negotiations with APEA coming forward. Um, we do have different scenarios and conversations that we still need to run with the team. Um, I have not, the, the budget team sent this over to me. I'm presenting this to you. We have not run the possible scenarios with the, with the district team to determine what or how we would need to shift. Um, it will be a grave impact to elementary programming. We need to be able to determine what this needs to look, look at 
if it's going to be personnel versus operational, I will always go to operational first um, in terms of what operational costs we can cut and what does that look like to reduce the impact to our programming. As you can see, our students need that direct instruction. Um, they need that strong tier one, tier two, and tier three supports, but our budgets may not be able to support that. And um, we need to determine what we are doing. I will say that the team, and I have to thank Shannon, has been very vigilant in trying to apply for different grant funding and competitive grants. Um, a part of that we know is the fact that we are gapping a district improvement plan. Um, Mary has some, um, I think the last time we updated a SOA plan, but there are some, the district needs to set the direction so that the schools can move forward. So we are looking at how we can set that district direction um, and create a district improvement plan so that when we apply for these competitive grants, we have a solid plan in place. Um, but these are the scenarios that we're faced with. So I'll stop now so we can have some questions because I know we kind of pass time, Sarah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, boy, so much, so much challenging news this evening. Um, I would just remind every and thank you, Shannon, for, <laughs> for being here and so late. I would just remind the committee and, and the, the public that the town of Amherst will present its financial indicators, which is kind of its early guidance about what next year, the next budget year is going to look like and start handy, like here are the probable percentages at a meeting um, on November 4th. And that'll be a joint meeting with town council and then all the school committees. So we'll get some more information there and see if they're even contemplating three or four percent or or what. So let's take a few questions. And, and, and Sarah, I know in our planning meeting for this, this was one of the reasons why you wanted us to kind of start. And I know you were hoping that we were able to and so I'm, I'm very happy that we were able to run through at least the three scenarios we don't have any cost saving measures like i said but at least now this gives the committee an opportunity to step in and talk about what would be best yes thank you thank you very much and to the whole team for doing this yeah i think given that we will have the financial indicators soon i guess i i wouldn't ask that you start presenting what the cost what the cost savings might be but no that works thank you any questions <laughs> Deb. yeah going back to that quarter one report where um there's three lines that are trending above three quarters but two are indicated no two are yellow and one is one is green um all one in is red i'm sorry two are yellow and one is red um, well, that's the 57, that's the facilities, but there's 79% district-wide SPED, 97% district-wide support, and 83% other programs. Is that because a lot of the expenses for those programs comes in the first quarter, the ones that aren't red or yellow? I believe so, Shannon. But... Yeah, so for district-wide SPED, a lot of those costs are encumbered at the beginning of the year. Um, for the entirety of the year. So uh, we're not really too concerned okay. um, with that. And then the um, district, both the SPED and the support. Okay. Right. Yeah, the, I could tell you the district-wide support. I looked at that specifically and um, the homeless slash foster care was over um, than what we budgeted by about 15,000. So that's the main driver right there. Okay. Thank you. Jennifer. Thank you for the early data mm -hmm. and for the scenarios, Dr. Z and Shannon um, and, and the rest of the team. Um, I hear you saying you haven't talked about or, or thought about um, uh, what, 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 the, what the potential cuts would be. Um, uh, and, but, um, you know, the, we're gonna hear our the financial indicators meeting is soon and it's bef it's November fifth, right? And our next Amherst School Committee meeting is gonna be after that. And I think we can be pretty com pretty confident that they're, they're gonna give us one of those numbers. So um I just would ask like we don't we don't need 
like, uh, sorry, we, you just said, we, Sarah just said, we don't need to be presented with cut options right now, but like by our next meeting, hopefully you'll have more information on what the town is going to, what the town's guidance is gonna be. And hopefully by that point, you will have been able to have some conversations with your team about what those cuts might look like so that we can start talking about them at our next meeting in November. Thank you. Yeah, our, our school committee meeting will be two weeks after the financial indicators. Yeah, I think, um, I sorry, Jennifer, I, I do agree. Um, I think realistically, this gives us an opportunity to see what we're facing. Um, and then based on what the town says at the financial indicators, where we can go and where we can actually go. Um, as you all know, I always plan for the worst case scenario first. Um, and so once that is what we have, which is a 1.4 million, um, we need time to line item out the budget and determine what our operational costs are versus what um, our actual personnel costs. I would say that our transportation costs in Amherst is higher because of the fact that we route students very, so, and we cross over in terms of bus routes and we have early routes, evening routes. Um, and so we we haven't had the time to run through those level of numbers to determine um, what the impact would be to programming and what, you know, what those things look like. So, but we're definitely prepping ourselves to do that. Um, and we're gonna have to do that worst case scenario first. Bridget. Yeah, thank you for all the information. I don't know what why you're gifted with giving us bad information <laughs> several meetings in a row. We still we we still appreciate you. I appreciate so, you too. I'm, I I yeah. mean I'm the one who has to take the bad information and make it into something. So yeah. why stay, why you know misery loves company. So let's do it together. <laughs> uh, I have a couple quick things. One is obviously Sarah in that slideshow you're working on. This should be top of mind. You know, and then the second thing is you notice the transportation costs and I'm wondering there's a lot of federal money right now for electric school buses. Could that help us anywhere that that's all I'm going to let this absorb and sink in when I'm less tired and see if I come up with anything else. Um, one of the things that we looked at when it came to, to transportation costs, even with electric school buses, is the cost of individuals to run the school buses, um, as well as the additional routes and what, what we're looking at and what do we incur um, in terms of overtime. So there's a lot of things that we have to break down to see what the exact issue is um, and then why we have so many additional routes so early in the year. Um, what is truly affecting us in terms of transportation in Amherst at this point, where we are basically about two months in and we're already in the red when it comes to transportation costs and our expectations. So we are going to take a deeper dive into that. Um, and again, what ends up happening is the lens that I have and I have to balance with my team is I have budget and I have programs and I have to sit between both and say, how how does the budget impact the program? How does the program impact the budget? And so that's the conversation that, that we need to have. How do we still run the district in the best or even the most basic manner and be able to fund it? All right. Irv, you get the final comment and then we're going to adjourn. Actually, I was going to say I was going to make a motion to the adjournment. Oh. <laughs> but, um, well, but, and I just want to say it's it's and it's really good time to adjourn because that presentation on the budget is incredibly depressing. And following on the on the MCA data, yeah. yeah, we have a lot of a lot of work to do, a lot of challenges. All right, maybe Jennifer's making a wants to move. Jennifer. I was actually going to suggest delaying warrants till next week, but I thought we should read the gift. Oh, okay, sure. That's I, fine. It's I, quick. I move that we accept the following gifts from Garden Club of Amherst to support $500 each to Crocker Farm, Fort River, and Wildwood Elementary for the Garden Project, a total of $1,500. And from Martha Olver, numbers 996864 and 996884 to support Crocker Farm at principal discretion for a total of $20. 
And from Walmart, various school supplies donated to Wildwood Elementary, estimated value $9,400 for a total of $1,520. There a second. Wait, um, Jennifer, that doesn't add up right. I believe that the estimated cash value wasn't added to the total. It was just the two cash donations. So I think the Walmart, right? Is that right? The Walmart um, estimated value isn't in in total, included in the cash total. Okay. Right. Thank you. Sure. Right. Is there a second? Okay. <clears throat> I'll second. <laughs> All right. Any more discussion of the gifts? I say thank you very much to the donors. Um, all right, Jennifer, how do you vote? Yes. Uh, Deb? Yes. Bridget? Yes. Irv? Yes. And I'm a yes, so that's 5-0. Thank you. We'll have to uh, table everything else. The handbooks were not ready, so we're not, <laughs> not delaying them. Um, so <laughs> thank you very much. I'm sorry? Can I say a few things about future agenda planning since that is an item on the agenda? Yeah. Yeah. I have three things. One, I'd love to hear about the status of the sixth graders at Fort River and, and what's what, what's the latest uh, with that. Um, I would like to hear about the status of the Amherst Family Center. I know this it's, it's been discussed shifting responsibilities from the family center to the school. So like what's going on with the family center? And lastly, I know today's been an unusual meeting for the Amherst School Committee, but it's been very frustrating and I object to being rushed and I object to, to school committee members being told not or being asked not to ask questions. We only meet once a month. And we've had we had to fit a lot in today, but it's I, and I, I even feel bad that Tanya and Mary had to rush and give us the speed dial presentation. I just I, 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 I'm uncomfortable with all that. So I would urge the chair to think about meeting management agenda length. And perhaps we need, do need to meet more, even though I just <laughs> we didn't more meeting. We need to, thank you. Yes. Yes. But tell me your first comment. Um, uh, sixth grade. Six grade or four, you're just talking about. Um, well, we that 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 maybe not everyone fits. Yeah. That's, yeah. You're yeah. not talking about the sixth grade move. No. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. All right. If anyone else has agenda requests or suggestions, yes, it was very heavy, very heavy meeting, and <laughs> we're all tired. Um, I move to adjourn. Is there a second? Jennifer. <laughs> all right. Uh, Deb. Yes. Bridget. Yes. Irv. Yes. Jennifer. Yes. And I'm a yes. Thank you very much, everyone, for all this hard work and thoughtful discussion, long as it was. Okay. Good night. Good night. Adjourned. <laughs>